Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV's podcast 482. Jim Miller, the disc golf guy, alongside Johnny V on a now officially chilly it's winter evening here in Wisconsin. Monday and Tuesday were the coldest days so far this fall, but I heard it's supposed to actually start warming up. Warming up for the Midwest in this time of year. We're, we're talking probably upper 40s as opposed to the mid-20s we've been sitting in, which... It's not fun. Yeah, chilly enough. Chilly enough for the cold turkey 18 to take place. Yeah, you got some uh, You got some snow yeah, for cold turkey. Yeah, we got a little turkey. snow this weekend. We're going to get all of t- to that and break down uh, the tournament that I ran this weekend and uh, kind of go over uh, some of the ins and outs of that. But if we want to really get warmed up, if we want to start thinking about uh, places a little bit more, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe a little more enjoyable than what is in Wisconsin right I now. Know. I think there's no better man to do it than to break it down from one Chandler Fry after a well a stint a trip a uh, a jaunt over to Africa. Chandler Fry, welcome to the show. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. I'd call it a jaunt, a three week <laughs> stint in Africa. Yeah, it was uh, two weeks in Uganda and one week in Kenya. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we we just uh, we'll start way at the beginning of. Very first thing, did you ever envision disc golf taking you to some of these places, Kenya, Uganda, otherwise? Like, <laughs> was that ever on a radar or a bucket list of yours or in your wildest dreams? Honestly, when I first started playing disc golf, I didn't expect disc golf to take me out of the Pacific Northwest. So you being able to go to yeah, you thought you were going to be stuck with Dion and Nate Sexting your whole life, and that was it. Yeah, and, and Scott Withers and, yeah, and Withers, yeah, Tree. yeah. But going to the, like just Canada, East Coast, and all those places has been amazing. But going to Africa is is next level. Just bringing the sport to a new continent and running the first tournament ever in Uganda and and playing tournaments in Kenya is just a, an unbelievable experience that I definitely did not expect to uh, go on. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations to be any part of something of that scale and that magnitude. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure you're going to tell us it's fulfilling and and magical for you, but then what it's doing also just for the entire sport and for, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people and maybe tens of thousands as a ripple effect is going to be incredible. So we're going to start with the basics and I want to throw it out to everyone. We're going to talk to Chandler here. For a little while we're also going to talk to raven klein and then we're going to talk to i believe zoe and dustin so we're going to be able to talk a lot about what was going on over there but uh from your perspective give us some of the basics how did this this entire project and destination how did this all come about and this is and, and yeah. how did you get involved this is your second trip over there correct yeah so uh paul Macbeth foundation there i forget what number project it was but they had a project in uganda in kotosi uganda which is a small fishing village off uh, lake victoria and then in deji university which is this incredible sporting university uh near kampala which is the capital of uganda and i went last year with uh, an incredible team from paul Macbeth foundation and we kind of set the groundwork. We helped design the courses in Katosi and in DJ. Uh, we, we handled a bunch of clinics, taught a bunch of kids and uh, community leaders. And we actually made some pretty good contacts with some of the older students and teachers. And they actually carried the torch while we were gone and uh, continued teaching and playing to a degree that I was not ready for when I first showed up. There was, when I first showed up at the course in DJ, there were kids all over the course uh, I saw the baskets for the first time at the course uh, last year. They were actually delayed in Mombasa, Kenya, due to some shipping irregularities. And uh, we didn't get the baskets, and we were able to help to build them or put them in the ground. So seeing those in the ground was a pretty awesome experience. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we the Uplay is a sustainability partner of Paul Macbeth Foundation. And uh, so they go to the places that Paul Macbeth Foundation goes about a year later. And uh, they chose me to come just because I had experience in Africa and I was part of the cr- the tr- crew that went before. And uh, I, I think my experience was valued on the trip. There's a couple <laughs> uh, situations that I was definitely helpful in. But overall, this, the trip was pretty smooth. I think we taught something like 2,000 kids. We, uh, we, As I said, we held the first tournament in Uganda. We ran a tournament in Kenya with uh, quite a few people. And... Uh, yeah, I want to go back. I think three weeks might be a little bit too long because for me, it was right after the tour ended. Yeah. So it was right after Disc Golf Pro Tour Championships. And uh, 
I actually, a couple of friends were supposed or I asked them to go with me because they kind of gave me a, like, who would you want to go with? And they're like, no, I want to go home <laughs> after, <laughs> after Charlotte. So I chose to go and like every day past like a week and a half, I was just like, oh, I need to go home. I need to go home. I miss my dog. But uh, yeah. When, when you talk about uh, being there and having this experience for a second time, uh, first of all, it's, it's incredible that you know you can name cities you remember places you you know you put pieces you know together uh you know some people still can't find africa on a map and yet you're you know you're able to locate and talk about these different places so when you talk about things that you've picked up or learned or brought along what were some of those experience are those travel tips are those uh you know native tips you know local to the natives like what are some of the things where you feel like you were exceptionally valuable uh, I think just my knowledge of the area, having been there before, um, I'd already made contact with a bunch of the people that we worked with on this trip as, as we did with last trip. So one of the guys, Israel, um, when he's the project leader at Ndeja University, uh, <clears throat> there's just there's cultural differences that we have, we have to navigate through. There's language differences. And uh, just having him as my friend and being able to communicate with him honestly and openly was a huge um, perk for the trip, just having uh, just someone who knows him prior to the to the trip and also with sammy uh our, our contact in katosi it was kind of the same situation just he trusted me he knows me and uh, we're able to use that relationship to kind of to build greater bonds with the rest of the team and with the local community so uh just kind of having that experience having been there is just huge for the team i thought personally that's what i brought to the to the table and also my professional disc golf abilities whatever those may be so. <laughs> uh, well uh, those are also stellar but uh when you talk about the team when it was all said and done and i've seen a few of the pictures but when it was all said and done what did the who did all the team consist of uh, we had Zoe Van Dyke, our fearless leader. She uh, led the charge. She was a project leader for the entire trip. Dustin, her second hand uh, in command, just awesome, hard worker, fantastic disc golfer. Raven Klein from Minnesota. Her partner, Alex Meyer, also a professional player from Minnesota and media specialist. He was the guy on the camera and doing the interviews and all that. And then we had James Koizumi from Calgary, Canada. I'm not sure what his exact role was with, uh, he's, he's a UPlay ambassador. I'm mm -hmm. not sure how he got connected with Zoe and Dustin, but he was awesome. He's a lawyer from Canada and he's very good at talking. So that was nice. <laughs> um, and then two UPlay board directors, Kim Johnson and Sarah Johnson, not related. I think her last name is Johnson. I apologize. But uh, they're the treasurer and the secretary from UPlay. They joined us. And uh, Sarah was a professional disc golfer from Oregon. And Kim had actually never played disc golf. And she played her first tournament in Kenya and won. So she has 100% wow. win rate in PGA tournaments. Well, I mean, internationally. I mean, I, we'll see how she does in the States, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we'll that, see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> no, that is awesome. What a story to say. Yeah, the, the first tournament I ever played, you know, was in Africa. And that isn't yeah. where you're from. That's, and I won. Yeah, and it's and also, won. yeah, it's, it's also at a course where the first thing we saw when we pulled up, we saw ostriches by whole ones basket. And that was such a surreal experience. And as we hung out there for a bit longer, there were zebras, Thompson gazelles, there were giraffes running around. It was, I mean, we've played, I know you've played on courses with wildlife and all that, but it was just next level, like safari disc golf. It was a lot of bugs too. But. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I know we're not, we're not here to focus on, on, on this, but that's yeah. also the event where you shot a 19 under par on one round 19 yeah. under not 18 not 17 19 yeah yeah I'll, i mean it was it was awesome i i call it i'm gonna call it my michael jordan flu game because i had a bad back and i had um what's a good way of putting this travelish sickness and uh, things were leaving my body very quickly okay uh <laughs> so i was struggling but uh I'll be the first to admit that the course is pretty soft. The mm. course is pretty soft, but having to deal with my personal things going on with my body and also just not making a mistake, uh, that was a pretty, pretty fun time. And I got to play with uh, Cameron Banks on my card. He's from, he's from Branson, Missouri. He was in Kenya because his sister runs a uh, secondary school with 300 kids. It's all, uh, she pays for it as a nonprofit, which is fantastic. But he drove an hour and a half over and played. And then Alex Meyer. Uh, so three guys and we're all hyping each other up, having a fun time, watching the giraffes, <laughs> and wow. hitting, getting birdies. 
Yeah, I was going to say that's not a sentence you can you know, regularly utter or even think about is, yeah, we're just, you know, hanging out with the giraffes and, you know, watching ostriches and everything else. Yeah. And this also no brings deal. up another funny side point to, you know, your 19 under rated a 1055. People always talk about <laughs> ratings in a perfect round and all this other stuff. I mean, you shot more than perfect, so to speak. Uh, and it'll get carded as a 1055, yeah. which clearly is a solid round, uh, no matter how you cut it uh, in terms of the rating. I'll take but, it. Yeah, exactly. I'll take it all day. Yeah, anything yeah. above your rating, right? So, uh, describe the uh, the amenities, or maybe, or the amenities, and then the challenges that go along with where you guys are playing. Like, what's the setting in which the course is entirely located in? Yeah, so Uganda was a bit different. In, in Deji University, it's, it's on a campus. It's well maintained. Um, they have regular maintenance that comes out and cuts the grass and all that. But then uh, once you get to Katosi, Uganda, it's on a community ground, pretty much just a field. And they actually had three baskets stolen, which we were not aware of until we got there by uh, people who were just looking for metal. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so they actually, every single day, Sammy and his, and his crew grabs the baskets and rolls them out mm -hmm. to the course, puts them in the ground. They play a few rounds and he brings them all back. And it's a solid like five 10 minute walk, you know, and with those baskets, they can, they're pretty heavy, but they actually roll them on the ground. So the, they're all chipped and beat up and they look way older than a year old, <laughs> but that's not the important thing. The important yeah. thing is that they're using them. So, but all, but the cool thing about Katosi is it's, it's right on Lake Victoria. So a couple of the holes you're throwing while looking at Lake Victoria or throwing from Lake Victoria. Wow. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful setting. And then in Kenya, it was a pretty special place because Kevin Becker is the owner of that course and that land. And it's a wildlife conservancy and he's had it for about seven years and it's a huge, huge property. And uh, he only uses a little bit of it for disc golf. And so whenever <laughs> Dustin and I played with each other, we we're just like talking about the potential of what this course has because <laughs> it's every hole can be lengthened by 200, 300 feet. Okay. You know, we can like, we're looking at a gold level, pro level disc golf course in Kenya. I just wish we can get find a way to get over there for the pro tour because it would be an absolute blast. Maybe we can get the Africa tour started because we got Uganda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, and Kenya now with courses. So yeah, I mean, that's that's not out of the realm of possibilities in the next five to ten years. I hope not. With the way things are going, I like I hope they have a couple stops outside of Europe and North America. That'd be amazing. Yeah, and I was just, I, of course, I have to pull up a map. I, I, uh, I could find where Africa was, but I had to find out, out where some of yeah. these other places were. Uh, when you're looking at um, the two courses between Kenya and Uganda, what, what are we looking at for a distance, roughly? And, and what's travel like? Oh, travel is brutal. It's uh, So we flew from Entebbe, Uganda, to Nairobi, and that, uh, the trip from Kotosi to Entebbe was about three hours long. But we got stuck behind the presidential motorcade. <laughs> and uh, this guy, his name is Museveni. He's been in power for like 40 years. And he travels with a, an army, just like 35, 40 ve armored vehicles. And so that three hour drive turned into five hours. Oh, and uh, we're all stuck in this little van and we're trying to go through the side streets. And the roads in Uganda are awful. A lot of potholes, not a lot of money to maintain those roads. And so mm -hmm. we're all stuck in this van and we all have our knees up and our necks down. Uh, but the next day I could barely walk because uh, my lower back was just, it fe felt like someone just took a sledgehammer to it. Uh. But uh, then we got to Kenya and the, the roads are much nicer. In Nairobi, it's, I, it's a bit more westernized, I, I guess you'd call it. Okay. The roads are a bit nicer. There's a, there's a lot more money in that area. And so th there's still the occasional bad road that you turn on but majority of the time it's uh it's nice and the <clears throat> hotel we were staying at was was wonderful all, actually all the places we stayed at were quite nice besides the cockroaches in katosi uh, okay <laughs> okay and that i guess would but be I mean, my follow-up that's fine <laughs> is, yeah. is what should if if somebody was inspired and wanted to have some of these experiences for themselves and you know they're pulling up udisc and they're looking at where these courses are and what they need to go to what are some of the things that you, you should tell them, you would tell them to expect or to plan for, or maybe not be surprised about when they're there. You know, yeah. like you just said, you know, if there's going to, if there's the likelihood of bugs or, 
Um, is that a one-off thing? Like, what are some of the kind of, what are the traveling pro tips? I say the biggest thing when traveling to Africa would just to remember to be flexible because time is viewed differently. And mm -hmm. at least in Uganda and Kenya, where if you plan for a clinic at nine in the morning, it could be 945 and they feel as long as they show up, they're doing their job. And then you kind of have to start it over and just, um, but yeah, just be flexible with time. Understand that people have different ideas of what time means over there. <laughs> uh, sunscreen, <laughs> sunglasses, because it's right on the equator. Uh, and also you won't be able to travel there without a yellow fever vaccination. And uh, I think you don't have to take malaria pills, but I, I suggest it because okay. there's a lot of mosquitoes. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I don't, I don't, burn very easily but i got sunburned a couple times so i suggest the biggest thing is flexibility and sunscreen wow those are some great <laughs> tips and then, that's what i always travel with so uh, yeah <laughs> yeah uh, there we go that's all you need <laughs> and and we're talking uh middle ish of october if you went you know right after uh throw pink usdgc time w what was the weather like and clearly the sun was out but overall what were temps and conditions like at that time yeah, it was it was pretty humid. It was the rainy season, and in Uganda, it's uh, so they're all kind of on the equator. But Uganda was more up in the mountains, and it's uh, pretty rainy and not too hot. But the sun is very extreme, being right on the equator. So uh, it was actually quite quite nice, similar to Charlotte weather when we left, but way way more intense sun. And then Kenya was a little lower and hotter. But it was actually not like it's, when you picture Africa, you might think of the Sahara Desert or mm -hmm. similar places where it's just burning sun and sand. Definitely not in either of the places we went. It was more Uganda is more jungle habitat and then in Kenya is more savanna. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, both very good for disc golf design. So I see John Houck, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> Eric McCabe, get over there and build some courses because there's so much land and there's so many people and so much talent. They're just waiting to play. They love it. Uh, and then maybe speak to the the possibilities, the infrastructure, the money, the support. Uh, is that something that if any one of those guys showed up and and we could get uh you know some course designers there, where does money for something like that have to come from? Does, would the government or school support that in any way, or is this still? need to be somewhat of a of a you know a philanthropic you know adventure for somebody yeah i'd say kickstarter is a good place to start if you <laughs> uh it's definitely not you're not going to find many big funders the government I'm, I'm not sure can be trusted to give you if even if they say there's a possibility of a grant or something i wouldn't necessarily trust getting it um i if, i know with paul mcbeth foundation they they sponsored the entire thing with help from ledgestone and pga and then you play helped you play fundraised most of the money for the <clears throat> trip this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we got any money from African sponsors, but I wouldn't say that's not a possibility. It's just, we didn't really search them out, Okay. but uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'd say Kickstarter or just get on the corner of a street, and start it, asking for money. <laughs> yeah. And now is it fair to say if, if money's raised and the ambassadors and the designers and people like yourself and others are there to help out, it is, is the concept welcomed with open arms? If you showed up and said, hey, we've got the equipment, we've got the know-how, we've got a few people, uh, it, would it be fully embraced and, and something could get developed? And would that move for very quickly? Absolutely. I think we're already seeing that because we've, uh, we've already been to, uh, we already went to Uganda and now we're in Uganda, Kenya. And then James Koizumi went down to Zimbabwe. There's another team that wasn't even associated with you play our Paul McBeth Foundation down in Rwanda the same time we were there building a course there, which I had no idea about until they contacted me halfway through our trip. Uh, I think that I, I forget his name. His is name John? is something, Sun, doc, Dr. Sunblock on Instagram. I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's, shout it's, out it's, Dr. Sunblock. Okay. I was going to say, and uh, I know there's a, a, a local gentleman. Uh, he goes by Roundhouse. Uh, John Lutzow is his name. And I know he's worked with Johannes over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for a number okay. of years and has talked about, Very you know, cool. getting more disc golf over there. And, and they've been, I think, uh, wildly successful. Unfortunately, I don't even know. 
uh, exactly where it is, but I know, I think, oh, it's Ethiopia, uh, if, if I recall. Okay, yeah, that's where Johannes is, yeah. Yeah. Makes so, you want to get don't... a new nickname, Roundhouse is way cooler than Channel. <laughs> <Yeah. Man. laughs> uh, we've known Roundhouse for probably 25 20 years. years yeah, here 25. In, he's from wow. Wisconsin. He actually lives, you know, a couple cities over from where I live, uh, just west of me. Nice. And I know he's been working really hard with Johannes and, and a lot of the others over there. So, like you said, the fact that you guys are there doing this, and then there's other entities that are also doing doing it and you're not even you know connected at this point uh is is truly incredible i guess that kind of leads to my next question which is is there a is there another place or vicinity or a, a general area or or a country or somewhere that you you know you have your you know your site set on that you personally would like to also go experience and be part of Personally, I'm pretty invested in Africa at this point. I would love to go back as soon as possible because I know one of the hardest things they have is um, what they have to deal with is getting discs mm -hmm. and baskets and all that. So I think the, the best thing that I can do personally is whenever I go over there is just bring 500 discs or a couple baskets in my carry on. And that helps them out so immensely because they either have to build their own baskets, which is what they're doing with the current Polymath project in Zambia, or uh, there's actually talk of manufacturing their own plastic over there. Wow. Um, so, and that'll be easier than shipping it because the shipping costs are ridiculous. And then having it go through all the ports and having like, you have Tariffs. to have a person at the port. Yeah. It's, you have to have a guy at the port to get the stuff through and you can bribe them all. That's kind of crazy. It's a mm -hmm. whole, whole new world over there. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty invested in Africa. I, I think I'd love to go to China possibly or, um, I'm, I'm just spitballing here, but China would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> Japan, I think they, they have courses over there, so I don't need to do that, but I just love to go there. Uh, and I guess I'm just going to echo what uh, what you're saying and what I've heard, you know, some of my limited experience being in Thailand. It, it's great we have so many people willing to contribute and donate and such. But one of the number one resources that we all need for lack of a better phrase is mules. We need when people travel mm -hmm. there to bring an extra suitcase just full of the used yeah. or the new Frisbees that have been collected because getting them, like you said, to the ports and or dealing with insane tariffs of, you know, a, a $10 yeah. disc, they may get there and then say, okay, well, there's a $10 tax on this for every single disc. So even a $10 yeah. wholesale disc may turn into 20 and that's just to get it into the country whatsoever. So relying on it, it feels kind of weird to say it, but relying on all of us to, uh, you know, bring as much in as we can uh, is really the yeah. way to go. Yeah. it's. I think it's, you play with the discs that Infinite and Trash Panda provided and as well as the personal discs that Raven and all of us, all of us brought. I think we donated around 2000 discs wow. on our trip. Amazing. So yeah, I think if we can do that again with more discs, pack less stuff and bring more discs, you know, that would be a pretty impactful move. And also congratulations on your recent purchase of the course in Thailand. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you. Fantastic I, news. Uh, yeah. And my, my little contribution is just uh, like you said, I mean, there's an investment in being there and the whole idea of just making sure that I, whatever I can do to help facilitate, to keep things moving in the right direction. I, that, that's all I'm doing. They, uh, yeah. Nigel and those guys laid that groundwork and uh, I'm, I'm just happy that I can help ensure that it keeps moving in the right way. Cause like you just said, they're building yeah. baskets and, and finding all these clever ways to actually get discs in. And um, there's just some of these obstacles, which sucks. Like we all talk about growing mm -hmm. the sport and, and having it be yeah. global. And then you're the thing you're running into is, you know, uh, you, you, uh, you can't get discs, yeah. Yeah. you know, or, yeah. Or, or having sometimes yeah. the equipment tough to make uh, happen sure. and show up there. Uh, wh what would you see is the biggest opportunity that you're excited about over there? And, and maybe that's personal uh, and you visiting and being there, but just in general, when you look at the scene and the, the landscape of players and the, you know, what is possible, like, what what do you what do you what do you see when you think of hey this is possible here in five or ten years what might that be what what could we dream big about? I think my biggest biggest takeaway from my trip in Africa was just the talent level that I saw from December of last year to November of this year. I could not imagine 
how, how much it improved. I played with this one kid, uh, Ethan Naguska, or Nagu Naguku, uh, horrible with last names, but uh, he was throwing, this isn't saying much, but he was throwing, he's eight years old, better sidearms than I am. And I know I'm not known as a great sidearm player, but he was like throwing buzzes 300 feet with a sidearm. He's eight years old. And he was just one of the many kids at in DJ University, Katosi and Kenny that we that we encountered that just blew our minds. We had one kid in, uh, it was at a, a school in Nairobi. It was actually a Norwegian secondary school. It was a very interesting concept over there. <laughs> but he, uh, we had a basket 300 feet out in the field and he skipped off the top of the top of the basket. Wow. And he actually ended up coming to our tournament because we we're like, you have to play in our tournament. We have to we have to see what you got. And he had, didn't end up winning. His brother won. And it was his brother's <laughs> birthday as well, which was kind of funny. But uh, yeah, the, the amount of talent and the youth is just unbelievable over there. Then the, the people we left there for the, to be the coaches are so motivated, so ready to teach. And uh, I can all, I can already see the improvement just from the people we taught last year, teaching the next generation of people. So uh, I think my biggest takeaway is that I think we'll be seeing a handful, probably a handful of thousand rated players coming out, of, assuming they, they can travel out of Africa, because it's going to be hard to achieve any thousand rated rating in Africa at this point. But if they can travel over here, I can see some pretty solid players coming out of East Africa in the next next few years. Which I, I hope it happens. I know money's going to be an issue, but if we yeah. can get some players over, they deserve a chance. Yeah, that that is incredible to hear that. What uh, I think about uh, rewinding a few years ago, and after Thailand, we went to Taiwan. It was Philo, uh, uh, Philo, James Conrad, um, uh, Nate Perkins. We were all there, and that's where we played with and and filmed Jackie Chen. And then you oh, watch yeah. Jackie, and the the comment I made was he was so methodical in his everything he did. Like it was like Paul Macbeth was playing. Mm. Clearly YouTube, clearly you know has these influences. Do the do the players and the up and comers, the people getting introduced in Africa, do they have similar opportunities to see or or even know about our top level players, or is this all? completely new to them. They definitely have the opportunity. I see a lot of cell phones over there, a lot of smartphones. I know a lot of kids don't have any devices, but they have their parents and their aunts and uncles that can help them out. Um, and whoever I talked to with or played with, I was like, watch YouTube. That's I, I learned yeah. from watching a Scott Stokely video back in the day yeah. on VHS. So I'm just like, I didn't, I, <laughs> yeah, yep. it was fantastic. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I told them every, like every chance you get, watch some YouTube, watch some of the best players in the world play, and try to mimic what they're doing. And uh, I hope that that sticks because I know data is difficult to get over there. Uh -huh. um, and also, cell phones are uh, are. are not as numerous as they are in America and computers and all that. So they definitely have access to it. It just might be a little bit harder to achieve. Okay. But uh, hopefully they watch some, some Paul Macbeth and maybe even some channel highlights if you can oh, find yeah. those on YouTube. And uh, maybe we'll see a, a pretty good putter coming out of Africa in the next few years. <laughs> I love it. And and I, I could wrap yeah. that up, thought up. I Maybe, just maybe, there there is still a recycled use for some old MSDGC videos or some of the other DVDs uh, that, oh, yeah. that were made. I, I've, I've got all the DVDs in one of these. <laughs> exactly. I, I've got there. hundreds yeah, of Yeah, get some Clash videos Clash out there. Videos those yeah. Clash videos with Barry I've got plenty Kenny, of those yeah. that never sold, you know, or that, you know, died out eventually. So if you, I got 19 versions of Rennie Gold, right? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so maybe yeah, a couple inexpensive DVD players uh, along with a, a stack of DVDs. Uh, then you don't need the data, right? You don't need the, the phone. Go, yeah. you, you go that route. Um, could still be very beneficial. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Chandler, we're going to start to wrap up because we're going to have another uh, guest who got to go over there as well. Um, give us any parting thoughts or shots or, or takeaways, lessons, whatever you want to do. The floor is totally open to yours. Share anything else you want. Uh, regarding this experience and or, um, you know, the, the future, whatever it is. We'd love to hear it before we let you go. It is Tuesday, correct? It is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> the, it's the off season. And to be, it's fitting that it's Giving Tuesday today because I want just to highlight you play Paul Macbeth Foundation and any other organization that I might be forgetting about. 
people that are going out there and growing this sport that we all love in Africa, in South America, in Mexico, uh, Europe. I, I know they did a couple of projects over there. If you have anything to give instead of going to Amazon and buying that $20 or whatever it is that you don't really need, consider giving it to Pond Bath Foundation or Uplay because they are using that money so very well. And uh, yeah, I just uh, thanks for let, help, having me on. It was fantastic talking to you guys. Always. I can't wait to go back to Africa. Africa is an incredible place and it deserves all of our attention and uh, maybe not all of our money, but at least some of it. So consider it next time you give. And thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Chandler, thank you for uh, obviously your, your, the way that you're an ambassador, you're, you're such a kind and uh, incredible spirit out on the course. And we've seen what you do with your uh, posts on Mondays and just really trying to keep it real for everyone out there. And uh, it's no surprise how beloved you are. And I couldn't think of a, a better representative to have over there in Africa. So we, uh, we absolutely love you and appreciate you. Glad that you're having an incredible time. And if you're one of our uh, ambassadors that continues to do that work over there, like I said, it, we couldn't pick a better one. So thank you. And well, uh, have a good that. off season. If yeah. anything, say hi to Ella for us. Tell her we'll have her on the show sometime this off season. Yeah, <laughs> as we'll, we'll do. And you guys say hi to Raven for me. <laughs> we will. All right. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a good one. Awesome. All Thanks, right, guys. See, see you later. Right. Bye-bye. Chandler Fry said he's uh, just before we brought him on. He said, yeah, he's out in uh out in Seattle area, hanging with uh, one Ella Hansen and crew. So uh, I'm going to send a message over to Raven. I think if she's ready, uh, she can join us. Looks like she might just about be getting ready to go. We're going to get a few um, yep, details looks like she's, sorted out. Looks like she's got it. Uh, not yep. cool. Um, oh. We'll get, oh, look at that. Yeah, she's on the ball more than we are. <laughs> go figure. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to now welcome another one because, you know, we just have people flying around, going to Africa, spreading the love of disc golf. None other than Raven Klein. Hello. Hey. How you doing? How are welcome. You? I'm good. Good to hear now. All right, so we just heard some of the crew out in the Pacific Northwest. I know where your home base generally is, but I don't want to assume where you're at. But uh, without doxing you, where, where, where are you spending some time right now? I am in Minnesota. All right, nice, all right. Warm weather. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you've got the same. You've got maybe even worse, depending on where you are in Minnesota, than we have it here in Milwaukee. So. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I think it was like 16 degrees today and yesterday, or something like that. Yeah, just a little bit colder than here. Yeah, we, we were hitting 20s, but. Uh. Not not <laughs> pleasant. Well, I, that that kind of was our lead into Africa and the weather over there, but. Uh, we'd like to talk to you about your experience and uh, give us let's give us the backstory. How for you did you get involved, and how did the opportunity present itself for you to go over to Africa? Um, well, this year I was able to work a lot more with UPlay. It kind of started because Ella was one of the leads, and Ella is one of the people I spend most of my time with on tour, and. Just every once in a while, she'd be like, hey, we're teaching on Wednesday morning. If you're free, come and join us. And I was like, oh, OK, yeah, that sounds fun. I've had a history in coaching. Like I've, I've been a coach for like 10 years in a bunch of different sports. And I can't really seem to get away from it. Like I always somehow get pulled back into coaching, whatever it is that I'm doing. Um, and I really loved it. I've, I've really enjoyed working with you play. And then a couple months ago, I got a call from Zoe, which we'd only ever talked a handful of times prior to that, like outside of Uplay. And I don't remember exactly what I was doing, but she was like, hey, do you want to go to Africa in the off season? <laughs> and I was just like, uh, good afternoon. Like, how are you? Like, what, what did you just say? How do you say no um, to that? And, like, unless you and, literally and, have you like know, a different agenda, I, I don't know. I know. And I was, I was like, okay, what, like, Okay, and my brain started going. I'm like, I had time to ask some questions and get a little more information because my immediate answer was like, yeah, of course I do. What, do you, what What's the rest of it? Like, what's the rest of your question? <laughs> um, and obviously being a touring player, living in a van, stuff like that, I was nervous about possible price, things like that. I was mm -hmm. like, can I actually don't go on this trip? And she was 
you know, you know, Zoe, just very supportive, very, I asked her about budgeting, stuff like that. She's like, I love that you're on the ball. Such a good question to ask. <laughs> and after, <laughs> you know, maybe a week of thinking about it, and then we got a little more information on the trip. And I pretty much just did like a tentative, yes, I'm in. And we moved on from there. And then a couple weeks later, we pretty much had to decide because they needed to start getting visas, booking the trip, getting everything set. So it was like, you have two weeks to decide uh, if you would like to extend your tour by basically a month. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's exactly what uh, Chandler was just talking about. I mean, obviously a lot going on as we wrap up and we move into, uh, you know, the, the pro tour playoffs and uh, everything that that <laughs> like the can entail. time of the year. Yeah, that exactly. Worlds, the pro, <laughs> pro Tour playoffs, Throw Pink, uh, and then the DGPT finals. And everybody has, mm -hmm. you know, a, a different, uh, you know, version of those things. But those are all going on. And it was literally like, what, two, one or two days after the the, the uh, Throw Pink that you guys were out of town, right? Not after the Throw Pink, after the finale. After, after yeah. the DGPT so finale, was, yeah. The finale finished up on, you know, Sunday, and we left on Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. So uh, I think it's a fair question, especially because you had asked it initially too. I don't need every detail, but I'm sure the world is wondering what do uh, finances slash like obligations look like? Is is this something that's largely uh, expected to be funded by the individual or is, is this where the Macbeth Foundation and you play step in? And I know there was a fundraiser at one point. Like, how, how do some of those things unfold for somebody that might be kind of listening with at least one ear about the idea? So with trips like this, a lot of it comes into, you know, funding grants, stuff like that. I mean, we got a grant from the PDGA. They helped out with like the international stuff. We have obviously the Paul Macbeth Foundation. Anytime you play does fundraisers like the we had the disc golf strokes this year with the mm -hmm. paintings. Yep. that we did back uh, at OTB, and all the money from that goes toward this trip. There was a certain amount of funding uh, each player had to, or coach, or you play um, partner that went on the trip had to do for themselves for mm. different things that we had to pay for over there. But all of our fundraising and grants covered the travel, lodging, transportation, things like that. And then we all had a small amount that we had to figure out for ourselves. For me, I did a fun, a personal fundraiser and collected things from some of the touring players. Chandler was actually one of them, even though he was also going on the trip, donated to my fundraiser because that's just the kind of guy he is. <laughs> but um, yeah, my fundraiser was really helpful for me because I'm not, you know, rolling in the dough. Just but. go for it. <laughs> As my, yep. as my as my sweatshirt says, disc oh, golf rich. Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm rich in okay. here. Uh -huh, yes, uh -huh. in, it's internally. It's, yes, exactly. That, that, yeah, rich in experiences. Yeah, that doesn't buy you groceries. Sadly, mm. no. Yeah, no. well, that, that, that's all part of the I think the overall definition of disc golf rich. Like <laughs> it's we're rich in a different way. Uh, it, my, yeah. My, so uh, yeah, I think I was that it was kind of a raffle like situation for how you were fundraising, yes. right? So I think I remembered seeing you pulling some of the names and doing some of the drawing for it. Um, and so it's yeah. great to hear that was successful, uh, which I think is great. So I guess then the follow up to that would be, and maybe this is a Zoe question, I don't know, but is is this if someone's listening and thinking, man, that sounds like the trip of a lifetime, I think I would be a a resource and a an asset to you know one of these trips. Is that a is that an application for you know Joe Public or Jane Public? Is that uh, reaching out to Zoe? Well, like, do you know how that kind of would work for someone who's maybe not a touring pro? I'm not entirely sure how it would work. Um, I know most of our group comprised of you play board members, touring pros. And then uh, my boyfriend went on the trip, but he is a media person. So he's a mm -hmm. Minnesota local pro, but then does a lot of, he's an amazing photographer. Um, and he captured a lot of our media. So some video and photography. So he was an asset on the trip as well as, a, I mean, I know he made the trip better for me. That's a, <laughs> you know, a three week trip. I had ex <laughs> extended my tour, that kind of thing. Um, good to have that like shared experience mm -hmm. on the road. Um, but I would say for someone who's not sure, it's a great idea to reach out to Zoe. I mean, she is like the head when it comes to a you play trip 
And I think it's really important. But what I would also say is when it comes to a trip like this, one, try your best not to let the money stop you because it is a once in a lifetime thing. But also the maybe lack of funding, that's going to be the easiest problem or thing you might have to deal with just because trips like this can test you. They're amazing and you do great work, but I wouldn't, it's not for the faint of heart to take Mm. a trip like this. Yeah. And th- that's, I was going to say once in a lifetime, unless you're Chandler, who's going to be like anointed. <laughs> well, the new okay, disc golf. So, yeah, <laughs> but you're Chandler. right. Well, let's face it. Like, I think we can all attest. You know, Johnny's yeah. been to Japan and we've been to all these, you know, some of these exotic places. You think it's once in a lifetime and then you get the taste of it and you're like, oh shit. And I, then no, you're I like, need I to go gotta back. go back. <laughs> yeah. I, or I need to go try something, you know, adjacent to it or similar to it because mm-hmm. you get the taste of it and it's just so incredible. Mm-hmm. So I love hearing that. Um, what is, I mean, I can rephrase once in a lifetime just to be like, it won't be exactly the same uh, when you go back. Yeah. yeah. Fair. Yep. And, and you know, I guess that leads to the next question, which is what, what do you feel like is next for you? Um, if anything more, uh, you know, of this style of work, could you see yourself, you know, throwing your hat in the ring for the next trip to a different country or, or do you feel like maybe you have a, any kind of you know, tie specifically to Africa, like we heard from Chandler? Um, I think, well, besides obviously like touring and continuing to work with Uplay in the, the week to week uh, community connects, which I really do enjoy. I would absolutely put my hat back in the ring to go on another one of these trips. Um, Chandler obviously had that, that double trip, that connection with some of the people where he was able mm-hmm. to build a rapport I really like being part of that second trip. Like, I think I would love the build that they do the first time around, but I almost like the second trip better and getting to teach all of these people who are just getting their hands in it. Um, And I think that goes back to all the coaching in my past. But I would love to go to another country and just see if I have to adapt my teaching style, if I have to, like, almost keep me on my toes like because i've now been to uganda and been to kenya and i am more familiar with the culture and what to expect i wouldn't want to get like complacent in it Mm -hmm. but again you know not to say that's a that's a bad thing because the more familiar you are with something the easier it is to attack it and the more prepared you are which is a comforting thought um but i think i would absolutely love to go somewhere else get to meet new people, make new connections and plant more seeds basically. Yeah. And I think your perspective is, is so valuable in that, like you said, Chandler was there in, in helping build some stuff last year. And then this year had a tie to it. I think everyone has to recognize maybe where their best fit is because maybe the, the physical course design and or installation and some of those nuts and bolts things, maybe that's just a part you don't find as appealing as opposed to maybe something that's slightly more established and, you know, being able to kind of pick up the ball and run with it from there. And I think that insight is so valuable for people to recognize for themselves and, you know, maybe every yeah, project. And I, I mean, I love the building aspect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I think everyone who's, gotten bit by the disc golf bug at some point has walked through a park that they've been in their whole lives and they'll look to the <laughs> side and they're like hmm, hmm that's a par four you're like yeah mm-hmm. right there i was like oh i didn't even notice it because you know a couple of years ago i wasn't a disc golfer and then you walk through the same areas and you're like yep that the only thing would be that tree or oh that's got to you know you start to see things yeah. in a different way and so i know i i'd love the build aspect of a trip and getting there plus the actual physical work of clearing things and like i love that i did a stint of work in the conservation corps and i just like doing stuff like that um but yeah i do i do enjoy the established part as well because it's like okay i don't have to worry about where you're gonna play now i get to teach you the fundamentals and for those few people who it clicks with right away you get to dig a little bit deeper and i love (laughs) almost nitpicking with things like I like taking someone who's decent sure. and being like, all right, let's get into the nitty gritty and these little parts. Well, and I'll follow that up. Uh, first of all, I'll make the uh, plug or announcement. There is an impact report 
that is 21 pages, and we'll probably talk to Zoe more about it uh, in terms of the details to it, but that does exist, so people can, of course, should go out and read all of that. But one of the things in that report, uh, it it has you listed here, of course, it lists all the different things that took place, but then one of the things in the report is you talking about how um, you like the chances to teach the teachers and not just the students. So again, I feel like there's so many different opportunities and we'll say niches for people to kind of slide into. So maybe describe that for us where where that comes from, where you're excited to teach the teachers as opposed to maybe some of the students or in addition to. So, yeah, I mean, obviously teaching the students is fun and something, you know, I've obviously been talking to people about this trip since we've returned Mm because everyone's Mm -hmm. curious. And I mean, I would be too if I had a friend who went on a trip like this. And something that I keep saying and Alex keeps saying is that no matter how old somebody is, the moment you put a disc in their hand, everyone is a child. Mm-hmm. This, the excitement is just through the roof. The smiles are ear to ear and it's, it's contagious. Like everyone was just having a great time. Um, for me, being able to teach the teachers, we had a couple lessons where it was a smaller group. It was just the people who were going to continue to do these jobs once we left. So it was like a sustainability project in itself. And being able to teach the teachers, we got to go a little bit more in depth. We got to not only teach the game, but give them ways to teach the game. So we got to take everything a step further and they were all so excited and they were like sponges. They were just taking in everything. And, you know, we had maybe a couple hours with these teachers and two days later we got to watch them teach and it was i mean they went with us the next day to all the schools and they were a little hesitant on the first couple because they're still learning it and they kind of be at the side with us and help as we needed it and then we had we did this one trip and i'm sure zoe would love to talk about it it's in the report um but we went to this little island and they didn't speak any english so we were pretty much useless besides just being there um as kind of a I don't know, like a zoo, like they got to look at us, <laughs> sure. which was cool. Eye um, candy, the, the superstars. <laughs> yeah, we were just there and they were just like, who are these people? But then our coaches taught them, like the people we had taught several days earlier did an entire lesson with this island of no one who spoke English. And it was one of those moments where you could see how excited Zoe was. And she was about to go in and say something. And I grabbed her shoulder and I was like, just wait. I was like, let this one happen. <laughs> I was like, let, I was like, this is like your chance to see exactly what you've been doing for the last eight days. Yeah. And basically you can be a fly on the wall for the next 20 minutes. And like, this is what it's going to be like when we're gone, you're still going to have people who can teach the game and are excited to teach the game. And it was like, that was a very emotional moment for all of us when we were there. Um, and you could just see everyone in, in the team just kind of like standing back and with their phones out because it was, you know, an amazing moment for all of us. That was probably one of my highlights of the trip. Well, all too, all so often, any one of us that plays disc golf, you get that, that, um, excitement when you give somebody a tip or a lesson or a strategy or whatever you, you help someone just for a moment. And then all of a sudden they take what you just said adjusted their hand or their finger position or whatever they fling it and then they turn and look at you with that that you know that (laughs) look on their face like oh my god that was amazing how did i never know that yeah like i've got to feel like that whole that that entire trip has got to be filled with the whole trip was like that yeah (laughs) like just like non-stop like your your uh levels have to be going through the roof it's like an eye twinkle yeah. constantly <laughs> yeah. of just like, oh, wow. It's, I mean, you can have, you can have seven people explain something to you, but it might be the eighth person when you finally understand it mm-hmm. because they use one different word or like whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But that feeling that you're talking about, you're like, oh, the moment it clicks was a lot of the trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you, with the teachers, were... it was just sustainability. You know, we're gone and they can still keep doing the job. Okay, yeah, let's go there because I feel like that's a that's a very legitimate concern and question <coughs> that you know we see the likes of the Paul McBeth Foundation uh, and we've seen the Marco Polo program and a few other grants and programs happen. 
we want to know that ideally these baskets and this equipment isn't you know it's getting placed in an underserved community but when you go back used. yeah when you go back in six months or a year is it still being used or did it get overgrown and now no one cares those types of things so maybe uh, explain like the the sustainability uh, concept that you guys are really striving for in the partnership with the foundation so in growing the sport it's not just about coming in putting on the show handing out discs and people being like oh do you remember that one time those people were here um the fact that we were the second trip alone is a great start mm -hmm. um but i think what's huge and what people may not understand is just how incredible the opportunity is for the people that we were with to have a course that close to them. I'm specifically kind of talking about the Indeja University course, but the Katosi course as well. Having something where the community can go and play is enormous because I think people don't understand some of the differences in the culture there in the fact that no one really has like other hobbies mm. over there. It's not. I, I was talking to somebody about some of the stuff that I do, one of the kids, and he's like, you do a lot of things. And I was like, <laughs> yes. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, not a great example because I do like too many things sometimes, <laughs> but they don't just walk around and fill their day doing hobbies. So to have this one thing that they can do, we have a couple um, of the students who had our numbers through WhatsApp and every day they're messaging Zoe, they're messaging us to like, we just finished our practice. Like we just got done playing. We're gonna, or we got done with our putting. We're gonna go play the course. We <laughs> got done with this. We're gonna go play the course. And they're, they're like nonstop. Like the excitement for this isn't one of those. It's not a one hit wonder. Like this is something they are introducing it into like the college, like into the university programming to have disc golf be an option. And they are the go-to place for disc golf in Uganda and in Africa. And so what we might think of something that you like, oh, I was really excited about this for a week, but then I found a new thing. That's not really the same concept over there. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and I feel like that uh, I can associate that with a little bit of traveling to Finland and Estonia and a few of these other places in the last few years. It's not to say they have nothing else to do, but they're they are not nearly as uh, either distracted. distracted and or presented with a million things. I mean, mm -hmm. you're not debating. Are you going, you know, go karting or rock climbing or mini golfing or disc golfing or playing basketball or baseball or pickleball? Like those all aren't on on your menu on any given night of the week. And so when disc golf's there and you can play it alone or with your friends. Uh, it becomes such an obvious go-to, and I it sounds kind of mm -hmm. like similar situation there. I mean, to use the old cliche, like if you build it, they'll come. Like, let's get some courses in, and we're going to develop thousands, tens of thousands of new golfers because it it might be the best possible thing that they'll ever find in their life. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, that's uh, I, I that's incredible to to hear that perspective and. Uh, what do you see as, you know, we were talking to Chandler about, you know, DIS and um, maybe a few other things. What are, you, what are you seeing as opportunities or challenges that we can work to still overcome, you know, when you left there? What are you thinking like, yeah, let's really address this. Let's get this fixed or, or look at it. Is there um, I'm not entirely sure what Chandler covered, but I mean, getting, getting discs in is mm -hmm. really difficult. We yep. ran into that one They've never seen them before. So we got stopped at every single security checkpoint. Ah, yep. And they were just like, what are these? And we're like, they're Frisbees. And they were just like, we don't understand. And I'm like, I mm -hmm. I don't have a better way to describe it. I was like, it's <laughs> kind of a toy, but more important than a toy. I was like, we throw I it, but we don't, don't catch know. it. So it's not like a boomerang, <laughs> but like it's for fun. Yeah, but... so we got stopped everywhere <laughs> Okay. for them. And that was like, you know, we had bags of minis too. So that we were just really throwing people off. And then uh, in Kenya, we got stopped. And in a lot of these places, when you're crossing a border, whether it's a country border or even just some of the territories, you can get taxed on everything. Mm -hmm. So not being able to get stuff in is huge. Um, so having the people that we have on the ground are great. 
But even sending things there, we talked to a couple of people and they're like, yeah, half of the things that get sent here never get to where they're going because they're just, it's just not the same type of system and anything can pretty much be taken at any point. And so trying to send these large things, you don't know if it'll ever make it there, which is a real shame. Um, but I, I don't have a solution for it um, for a larger scale other than having people who are traveling and they just deal with the security checkpoints and you bring in as much as you can. Bring that extra suitcase and just fill it with discs or, you know, whatever. Not just discs, a big thing, actually. Like, everyone wanted a disc, but we were able to bring a couple, like, sling bags over and mm. satchels and those kind of things. That was enormous. Sure being able to have a small bag like it doesn't have to be a backpack it doesn't have to be like a combat ranger or <laughs> something like that or a zooka cart a sling bag over the shoulder anything like that they were like drooling over the bags having <laughs> something to be able to actually like carry your couple of discs with you um was huge and it can be everything we showed them even just like the towels chandler brought over a bunch of whale sacks like it was obviously the only thing you need to play is the discs, but anything helps and kind of gets them more excited and gives them another way to look at the game. Um, I remember we were playing doubles with a bunch of people and it started to rain on us and they all like ran off the course. And my group didn't because I didn't go anywhere. And they were like, what do we do now? And I was like, oh, we play. And they were like, you play in the rain? And I was like, yeah, they're like, doesn't it get slippery? And I was like, yes. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> I was like, and they're like, oh, and that's, you just keep going. And I was like, you do your best. But yeah, you just play mm -hmm. in the rain. And they're like, well, doesn't your disc get wet? And I was like, yep. yeah, <laughs> you wipe it if you can. Um, but you just keep going. And they were yeah. like, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> You learn and you're adapt, you adapt. Do do you feel like, and maybe this is, I don't know how relevant it for sure is, but when, when you have something like a bag to be able to carry discs, do you feel like, is is the bag just that much of a of truly a we'll say a, like a life asset to them or is it that they feel this um more professional like official capacity of playing disc golf because they have a bag or do you know what i mean like is the bag because um, because i because we, we take backpacks for granted we go you know there's a million backpacks true. that you could yeah. order tomorrow and have at your front door so is it is it from a more of a practical standpoint or is it more of a like hey this is what official disc golfers do or both i i think it's both okay. um i think the latter would probably come up first like i think okay. if they see someone with a bag they're like oh okay that's more serious <laughs> yeah um and that's for the people who are really getting into it some of the university students we dealt with they were just like oh yeah i know that if i have a bag people will take me more seriously as a disc golfer um however for 70 percent if not more of them the bag would just be a utility thing and they'd be mm -hmm. like oh i didn't have any type of bag before for anything yeah um my, my the doubles partner that i had she had never played before and so when we played that was the first time ever and i gave her a disc and she was like do you have she's like do you have a bag and i was just like i don't like i don't i actually <laughs> don't have anything else um she's like well i don't have anything to carry my stuff to school with mm. and of course you know you hear stuff like that and you we want to help more but i didn't really have the means to do much more than what i did do um but that would like not be an uncommon story so the bags are useful in more than the disc golf but if you are dealing with the people who are disc golfing every day for them it's more of a i would say it's a status mm -hmm. like a disc golf status sure yeah, yeah i mean so definitely I'm both which we know is true even here, you know, here uh, on the daily, you go to the, you go to the course, you have the person with one or two discs they're holding. Then you have the person with the two or three or five discs and in the plastic and, bag and the plastic bag. <laughs> and then you have your, your, you know, your initial starter bag and, then you have, the plastic bag <laughs> and you've got the M3 with the Calvin Heimberg limited edition $500 <laughs> bag. And you know, you just don't know. Uh, yeah. And, and is yeah. going to shoot 37 over par, but is, is, and his bags worth more than his rating, but Hey, Hey, uh, it, <laughs> we've got all the different options. Everyone's got a solution. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. I that's... and you know, you can you explain as much as you can too, because I had just a little over the shoulder like satchel bag for my five discs, and I'm I was still 
recovering from like a hand injury from the end of the season. So I was like, brought the lightest and flippiest disc I own. And I was like, yeah, this will work. Like, this will be fine. Um, and I was trying to explain to them basically what you were just talking about. I was like, don't, I'm like, don't worry about the bag. I'm just like, if you can carry around your one disc and shred, doesn't matter. I was like, I don't care what anyone else is walking around with. I'm like, hone, hone the skill, find your, find your shot, and you'll be fine. Uh, one of the questions that came in off the board is, uh, give either you could compare it to something we might know, or or just describe it entirely. What what are the courses like uh, that have been set up that you guys are playing? Like, describe maybe the the overall topography and the and the vegetation and such. Okay, so the first course we went to at Ndeje is quite difficult, actually. It might not be incredibly long, but it was, it had like vines, low ceilings, kind of jungle vegetation in the sense, and it was very forehand friendly, <laughs> um, which was something very interesting because I'm not a huge forehand player. I mm -hmm. like. <laughs> flip up and turnovers with my backhand, which was like mind blowing to them. Almost all players there are forehand dominant. That is the main thing that they do. Um, so this course, you had a lot of low ceiling, a lot of elevation change in these like rolling hills, but the fairways weren't, it's not like they're mowed like they are for anywhere mm -hmm. here in a park. Mm -hmm. So you might land in an anthill or by a termite mound or you might be under a bunch of vines or they had trees that had fallen from storms and they just kind of get they get like broken up and then they're in a pile and they're kind of off to the side um but that one was actually quite tricky in in the lines that you had to hit and there were definitely no like ground skips you didn't get anything like that wherever you landed is where you landed and you kind of got stuck um but that was a really fun one to play because you could tell the kids who get to play there all the time and they've got the local lines because you'd walk up to it and you're like, oh, I wonder where to go. And they would just sneak through this tiny little gap on a forehand. And I was like, I didn't even see that one. <laughs> like, um, so that course was really fun. There was one area we went in the rainy season. So it rains every night. And then the sun would come out the next day and get pretty warm. But there's kind of like a marshy area in the middle that you had to throw over, but you still had to cross it. And I just sank my entire foot was just covered in mud and they're just like walking through. And I was like, man, okay. I was like, this is fine. I got it. <laughs> um, and then the course at Kosi, so that, and in Deje was an 18 hole course, um, which was, it was honestly beautiful. And they told us there were monkeys, but we never got to see the monkeys because it was too, kind of like cloudy and rainy when we were there. Um, but then the Katosi course was just six baskets in the back open field at um, the winter school. And that one was just, it was a lot shorter. People who play like we do would have called it more of an approach type of course, nothing mm -hmm. too long. Um, but the safari options for it were pretty cool. So you could play it as the six holes that it was which still gave you some fun lines. They were able to use the trees, but it was shorter, like mid range shots for us, mid or putters um, for the kids. Obviously they threw whatever they had, but then at one point after teaching, we did like a three hole really long safari uh, where they got to watch us just like bomb it, which was <laughs> really fun. <laughs> and we were throwing like from the top of a hill down to the edge of the lake and things like that. So we went from an incredibly wooded course to just like a wide open course with really nothing in the way. Um, but it's a great practice for them. And it was kind of proof of it doesn't matter how far you can throw it. If you can't get it close to the basket, <laughs> like it, <laughs> you got to have control on the short shots as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the Katosi course, uh, thanks to our friends over at udisc.com. I think I could probably even put this in the comments real quick in case anyone cares. Uh, and I'm seeing yeah. it right now in the layout that's on here. Um, like you said, uh, playing down kind of near the lake. Uh, and, and mm -hmm. it looks like, I, I guess I didn't know what to expect in terms of the city size, but Katosi, uh, as, uh, looks like it's relatively populated. Or no? 
Yes, it is. It is pretty populated, but it's condensed. Yeah. Okay. Is maybe a good way to say it because Katosi is just a like a smaller fishing village. Okay. But yeah, they good amount of people in that area. So, uh, what what do you feel like is is next for you? Um, and what would either propel or restrain you from going on the next possible adventure or outing or, or, or trip? Um, I, I mean, there were definitely with any trip one, the fact that it was almost three weeks, I think no matter who you were with or where you went by the end of that trip, you're tired. Yeah. Um, with a trip like ours, we were, t I don't think we weren't tired at any point. Like you, <laughs> you travel for 30 hours, you get there. And then the first day we taught from sun up to sundown. And then we did the same thing day two. And we didn't actually have like an off day until about a week in. Wow. And our off days weren't, weren't really off days. They were like mm -hmm. the one day for us to do something personal. Like we went on a safari, but mm -hmm. that wasn't exactly an off day. It was get up <laughs> no. at 5 a.m., do stuff like it was. It's an exhausting trip, and so there are definitely moments thinking about certain aspects of that and, you know, difficulty in communication, things that can happen when you're traveling with a group, um, especially with different uh, communication barriers between, mm -hmm. you know, people on the ground. And so when you think about that, I would pause maybe before going on the next trip, but it wouldn't stop me. It would just be one of those things like, okay, remember you know, what would I need to do to prepare? What are the things that I need to remember to communicate with groups, things like that. But nothing would probably stop me from going on the next trip. And I would absolutely love to um, be excited to. <laughs> uh, knowing what you know now, having that, mm -hmm. all of that knowledge in your back pocket, what's the number one thing if you were leaving again for this exact same trip and you were leaving in a week, what's the number one thing that you would adjust or or detour or or fix or plan for or address what's the number one thing that was that lesson learned i would bring dramamine okay yeah i get um if i am not the one driving i get kind of car sick which mm -hmm. i never used to when i was younger but it's developed over the last you know eight years or so and i don't think i had a single car ride on the trip that was enjoyable mm. <laughs> because you're kind of in maybe maybe the safari truck just because there were no windows so i had air like the whole time um but every time we got into one of the small it was always a really compact vehicle so a lot mm -hmm. of these small vans ones vans here in the u.s that like churches and groups use for trips that have like 14 seats imagine that many seats but in a smaller vehicle, like into a minivan. So it was yeah. like the same number of rows, but smaller space. Um, so we had small vehicles, tight space, you know, maybe only a window cracked kind of thing. And for me, that was tough. So Dramamine would have been, <laughs> would have been fantastic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Chandler touched on it again, even some of the roads. So you're talking about, kind of the confinement and the space and then Chandler, you know, and then touched the bumpy on, roads. Yeah. yeah. The roads aren't, you know, it's some of the infrastructure, understandably not, you know, necessarily top notch. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that that only, uh, you know, elevated and, uh, <laughs> enhanced or decreased your experience, whatever. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That probably would have been my personal number one. Okay. I would have brought more sunblock just, I mean, I did okay, but I think, I think I still would have brought more sunblock. They laughed at us uh, when we put sunblock on. They were like, what's that? Why are you putting sunblock on? And we were like, we're different. It yeah. doesn't. <laughs> like, like, we're at the equator. We don't handle this well. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota here. Yeah. I know. And then, yeah. you know, us specifically, we didn't, have, we didn't have anyone on the team from like Florida or Texas or anything. We were all upper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was tough funniest <laughs> um we'll say challenge or or misstep that someone made on the trip that's that's shareable uh what, what would you funniest, say like what happened funniest misstep 
Yeah, like like um, uh, someone um, uh, go, go, going to the wrong restroom because they the, the the marking was wrong or something or not wrong. They in, they didn't correctly read it or Couldn't I don't read know, it. just anything anything silly huh. or uh, like ah ha, ha, that we had a good you know <laughs> chuckle about that for a few hours. Anything like that happened? I feel I don't think we had any major moments like that, and if okay. we did. I, I might have to go back into like <laughs> the daily journal I kept for the okay. trip just because so much happened. It, and let me start again. I think everyone had something funny happen every day. That was usually something someone said to them, but because we were so spread out and doing things, mm -hmm. we all missed like everyone else's moments mm -hmm. because okay. there were, you know, eight coaches and then 200 kids. So, it was funny because I felt like for the first five or six days, I didn't see anybody on the team. Like we saw them at night when we had dinner, but by the time we all got back together or we were on the bus, everyone was so drained that it was just like eight zombies on a vehicle <laughs> and we'd get back and we'd have dinner and we're like, wow, this is really good. And then after like 20 minutes, we'd be like, so how was everyone's day? Like, what did you do today? <laughs> and we would kind of swap our stories and, do stuff like that. And so we had, I would say, funny moments with the kids each day, but never like a one group funny thing, I guess, just because it seemed like we were always all kind of facing a, a different direction and doing something else. Okay. I had one personally that was just kind of funny that the group liked. Um, so Alex was ma our main media guy, but then he's a really good coach too. So I would sometimes switch with him and I would take the camera and then he would hop in and teach. But because it was so, you know, hot and everything, you're obviously wearing like a baseball cap or something, but I can't take photos with the cap on because then, you, you know, you run into it. Mm -hmm. So I would always turn my hat backwards whenever I was taking photos. And at, in Dead Jay, we were teaching and I was taking pictures and there was a girl behind like the bushes by the street and I was facing the other way and she, she was like, excuse me, um, coach, sir, I have a question. And I turned around. She's like, oh, oh my gosh, ma'am, coach, ma'am, I'm so sorry. Because <laughs> I had my, my short hair was kind of like tucked up. And she felt so bad. And it was so funny to me. And she's like, I'm really sorry. She's like, I was just wondering if this is fun. And she just kind of gestured to everyone disc golfing. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's totally fun. She's like, oh, okay. And then she kind of put her head down. And she was like, I can't believe I said that. And then every time I turned my hat backwards, I had the team would call me coach, sir. And say, yeah. <laughs> okay. well, there you go. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. <laughs> that, that's awesome. Um, following up with the media, and we'll, we'll start to let you go here soon because now we're going to get a, another, yet another uh, rendition You got to get the birthday girl. Yeah, you got to get the birthday girl, which I love the fact that we can have her on her birthday, but also she's going to, you know, they can tie up all of this adventure. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned the 21 page impact report. Mm -hmm. What was, um, you know, media or experiences or, or journaling, like you said, was there any of that, that, uh, from any of you that, uh, people could go possibly still consume Wait, you know, is that, is that stored on a TikTok or, or, you know, posted, was it posted there or Instagrams? And is that collective? Is that individual? What, what? If somebody wanted to go look for something, any suggestions? Yeah, so we we kind of did a collective media for this trip. We Alex was kind of brought on as like the sole media person when it came to the professional photography stuff. But instead of bringing like a camera person to get video, we all just cataloged the trip ourselves. So the eight people who went kind of have their own album. I'm slowly getting through all of mine and trying to get it up on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um but I know as far as photos, the Paul Macbeth Foundation and Uplay have shared some of the main photos from different coachings and things like that, that you could go back because uh, they were posting pretty much every other day we were on the trip. But then as far as the mass photos, Alex was getting all of those uploaded. So Uplay has a full um, like file of everything and I'm not entirely sure where they're going to share it yet. So that would okay. probably be a really good question for Zoe and Dustin. <laughs> um, and then I believe that Alex is uploading all of his to like a, a flicker or something that people will be able to check. So, um, 
barring, you know, one more conversation with him. And then obviously Zoe and Dustin, I'm sure that we could get that to you so that you could have even a link to share with people who are curious yeah. because the photos are captivating is honestly the best word that I could use for it because like we were, I'm sure Chandler talked about like their smiles and the joy is absolutely infectious. And I don't think we, I don't think Alex took a bad photo <laughs> yeah. of and like any of the teaching session. I mean, there's like bad photos of us, but there's not any <laughs> bad photos of them. I, I swear it was just like smile and excitement and cheer one after the other. And then on like the, I don't want to call it like the selfish part, but when we got to do the safari, which was absolutely top, one of the best things that I've ever done in my life, because I got to see lions and I'm a big cat person. <laughs> like, like I cried when I saw them kind of thing. Wow. Um, those photos are, I, I'm about to cover my wall and I'm, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> wow. Just the inside of the touring vehicle is nothing but big cats. Uh, oh, well, big cats, the giraffes. I don't know how you feel about safari and like certain animals, but it was the coolest thing ever. And whether you've seen them in a zoo or pictures or videos of them, it's nothing compared to seeing them where they live. It was mm -hmm. extremely powerful and just one of the best things ever, ever. Well, as we were talking about <laughs> that, uh, I received a text from uh, none other than uh, the kitty himself, Dustin, and uh, it's to a, f a huge <laughs> Flickr, yeah, a huge <laughs> Flickr account uh, that has a, a ton of. Well, it's you plays Flickr account, and then oh, it shows yeah, it's it broken up. up. It's got uh, Uganda. Uh, different schools, different um, days and sessions there, and it's all broken up. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is incredible. So I've posted that <clears> in <throat> the uh, in the chat, and if I remember, I'd like to post it in the official uh, description of tonight's video. But yeah, thank That's you, Justin. Wonderful. And uh, yeah, so there, there's yeah, they were working together to get them all split up between the schools we visited, the days we did it, and there, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, like you, like we were just saying, I'll get more of some of the maybe the nuts and bolts out of uh, Zoe in terms of the impact report and some of the other uh, details. But Raven, uh, it's it's so awesome and incredible to hear about your experience and and collectively the experiences that you guys have all had. Before we let you go, is there is there anything in any capacity uh, that you'd like to share with the world? Uh, right? regarding this or anything else you have going on, but um, anything else you'd like to share with everyone before we let you go? Uh, I honestly just want to like thank the groups that made it possible. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously you can always book a trip yourself and go somewhere, but being able to work with Paul Macbeth Foundation, you play having the support from the PDGA and just knowing that everyone who has a PDGA membership helped this trip happen mm -hmm. because some of those funds go toward providing the grants for trips like this to happen. So you might not think it, but anyone who is a member helped this trip be what it was. So I want to thank everybody and anyone who supported any anybody who went on the trip. So people who support Zoe, people who support Chandler, people who support me, Dustin, the board, anybody like that. It is little bits stacked on top of each other that makes big things possible. So you might not think about it, but um, you know, Giving Tuesday, I briefly taught Chandler at the end of his thing, um, and he mentioned that. And I think it's a really good thing to remember. Just if you have the opportunity, or maybe you see somebody out at a course and you've got an extra disc on you or something that's easy to replace. Maybe it's a new one, but you can get a new one because you have those means, and someone else might not. Just think about a way that you can share this sport with somebody. I love it. Couldn't agree more. I We always hear people talk about uh, growing the sport and we talk about kids are the, the next generation. We have to really embrace and, and foster that and foster uh, getting the hands into schools, kids and schools and kids in schools and all of that. <laughs> and that's exactly what you guys are doing. And then to be doing it in a completely different uh, continent and, and the work that was going on is... Uh, is is exciting 
and it's definitely very inspiring. And like I told Chandler, uh, I can't uh, think of a, a better ambassador than someone like yourself being there as well, representing disc golf, bringing the cheer, the love, the joy, the smiles, uh, along with all of your, uh, you know, credentials and, and uh, experience in teaching and sharing the love. So uh, from thank us you. as and the entire disc golf community, we, we thank, thank you. you for uh, going there and, and having the part that you did and uh it sounds like it appreciate was, that yeah and it sounds like it was rewarding for you as well which is uh, how awesome like you get to you did what you did and then uh even for yourself there's a little uh internal reward i think and uh it's all yeah i felt deserved. like i needed quite a few days to recover i was so like <laughs> just you know going from tour to a trip like that and then you get home after 30 hours of travel but then still have to drive home because, you know, the vans were in Charlotte. Mm -hmm. It was just, yeah, it was, I got home and immediately got sick. <laughs> it I doesn't seem fair, but yet it's understandable, right? Didn't you have a van tr trouble or two as well on the way? I hit a deer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I grazed a deer. It was uh, very, it was slight, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that somehow karma didn't didn't work there, but uh, I, I no, it was the really rest, unfortunate. Yeah, the rest of the world and disc golf world uh, still owes you and and uh, <laughs> shines favorably on you, and that'll all come back. We know that. Raven, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your excitement, your love, your passion, your enthusiasm of disc golf uh, with us, but more importantly, uh, with all of these uh, people in Africa and. Uh, Again, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing everything tonight. Of course. Thanks All right. Well, Thank have you. a great off season. Never Stay forget, warm. Never forget that you don't have to give discs; you can give your time as well, and that can be just as important. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> that is a perfect note, a perfect uh, finishing sentiment. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much for joining us, Raven, and uh, we'll talk Thank to you, you some other time during this off season. Feel free to drop oh, by I'm anytime. I'm sure I'll see you around. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Take care. Thanks, Raven. Bye, you guys. Bye. See ya. It's really funny, you know, talking with her and about, about discs in general. And I know we've said it on the show before, and I still do usually carry a new disc with me in my bag. And I would give one out if I ever saw someone that needed one. It's been like two years. And every time I go to the course, which isn't very frequently, to be honest, I rarely see new players. It feels like yeah. like the courses right now are are are, are filled with more I don't want to say experience, but people who've been playing longer. Mm -hmm. um, and un unfortunately, I wasn't getting out during the COVID boom when I think a lot of new players were. Uh, I kind of I kind of missed that you know year of playing when we were you know doing broadcasting and whatnot. But I, I still have a, a it's I believe it's like a one sixty something. Uh, disc that's sitting in my in my bag with me that I just it just sits there and I don't throw it it every once in a while I think I've I think my son has used it once or twice but it's always just waiting there to give to somebody and it's got to find the right person well <laughs> until then it's going to do its job of giving you you know helping with that workout it is it's going to put extra, it in my bag that half pound that, that extra hundred I like it I mean 60 it, plus it, it will gram. pay forward major dividends when it finally gets to someone sure. uh and and if you're wondering you think well how do I know who to give a disc to well when you come upon a family in the most polite way you can always say uh when they're out there throwing a regular frisbee oh, uh, in the most polite way say hey you guys might be enjoying this and that's great or an and ultimate disc i've seen or that an ultimate <laughs> that, that's when you say you might enjoy it more try one of these yes those, those are uh great uh, contenders for someone that could benefit from a disc or two is if you see someone out there with a regular frisbee or an ultimate disc and they may say no 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 we we've yep. tried that we don't like it we, we're going this route and that's fine but they seem like uh prime candidates <laughs> yeah. for someone that could use a disc and a couple of champions and disc I, throwers in their own right i do don't have think them in the green room i do and i don't think they need any extra discs no not for them not for them but they continue to spread the love and joy around the world as she celebrates a birthday birthday zoe and dyke and dustin Kinger. happy birthday zoe Woo! oh man thank you guys so much this is oh, like God. the best gift ever i just <laughs> love listening to chandler and raven so much that was awesome thank you guys for having us well of course and happy birthday but 
it, it's a thank you that's deserving to you guys as the people that are orchestrating and and putting together these opportunities and being the facilitators, instructors, leaders, all of those things. I don't, I, you know, Chandler and Raven, they have it together. It's not quite like herding <laughs> cats. Uh, I think they got their act together, but th- we need a leader. And uh, Zoe, you're out in front and, and Dustin's right there every step of the way. So thank you guys. And Zoe, Dustin, how another trip to Africa in the books. We've got a 21 page impact report, but if somebody doesn't Start want to read that, one. Yeah, no. <laughs> tell us what it's about. No. How, how are you guys feeling? Let's start there with, with another trip in the books. Well, yeah, we're still processing everything, honestly. Like it's, it was a life changing experience for both of us. And it, is still something that we talk about every day or like Raven said, we're getting messages from our African friends. Every, we wake up to them every morning, (laughs) giving us uh, insights, questions, feedback, all this stuff. So it's just like, it's, it's crazy to think about giving somebody disc golf in today's age as we've watched it grow over our 15 to 20 years in the sport and they're starting at ground zero, but like the sport is, is not at ground zero anymore. Mm -hmm. So like the rapid, like they have YouTube, they have other stuff where they can go and learn. So like they can grow and learn at such a higher rate than we were ever able to when we first started. So it just watching that happen and unfold in front of our eyes, is pretty surreal and we just we love it like we literally africa we talk about africa all day long every Every day day. day. (laughs) it's crazy and to finally finish the report and put everything that really went down into words as much as we could um took a took a couple weeks obviously since we got back into the states and we're still uploading all the photos and the footage and there's going to be a lot more content to come so like yeah just stay tuned in with us and experience africa as we get to share it with everybody and we're still learning new amazing things that are happening every day like it's crazy so it's so much fun yeah and i i think i just want to say that this like this trip was a a gift to my life like like dustin said that this this changed my life in in such a way i couldn't have ever like imagined or like written down or dreamt up and i feel like personally i i've changed and grown as a as a as a human and you play has found higher thresholds and and just really a, a bigger ceiling of what we can do and we're We've, we've really figured out and we're really confident now and stronger in what it is we're doing. We're, we're, we're giving disc golf globally. We're, we're, we are responsible for sustainable disc golf education and it means something so much different than it meant over a month ago to me. It, it means so much more. So it's really hard to like put that into words, but. Do do you feel in some ways, and, and I want to talk about some other, you know, adventures that weren't just uh, Africa here for a moment, but do you feel in some ways that this trip was really like a proof of concept? Like, yeah, here's the, you know, there's the thought, oh, we're unsure, let's go do it. And now you come back and you're like, hell yeah, like this. Nailed I mean, it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I am. Uh... I, a couple thoughts on that. Number one, I'm so proud of the book and I'm so proud of the fact that the second edition came out. But now I actually, since I came back from this trip, like I finally know how to finish it again. So <laughs> there's going to be like a third iteration and it's going to be much more available and, and much more, um, much more really what it was always supposed to be that I couldn't have ever known writing it 
putting out the first edition, putting out the second edition, you can't know these things if you're me anyways, until you've lived it and experienced it. So proof of concept, absolutely. And it's like the veil was kind of taken off, you know, like the blinders or whatever were released from my eyes and like the vision of how to go forward and what, what the rest of my life, what I'm supposed to be doing is like so obvious and I'm so <laughs> stoked. <laughs> now with that, I, I, you've been on some other disc golf adventures. You guys have both traveled, uh, both internationally, internationally, but I mean, obviously, uh, within the States, but then internationally, what, what's different? How does, how did this trip compare to any of the other teaching and promoting and, and sustainability or, or anything else? How, how is this trip different from some of the others and, uh, name off some of the other places you guys have recently been? Yeah, well, I'm going to start on this one. Yeah, yeah. So just this year alone, in January, we started in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and that was that was a really cool trip that um, aspired and evolved from our last year's first sustainability trip in partnership with PMF in mm -hmm. Guatemala. And again, that was our first trip in partnership. And we consider Uganda the second trip and Kenya the third trip. So two and three were all in one. Sure. Because there there were such different societies, different um, fields, different places, and two different courses under two different sets of fundraising for the original build. Mm. So what we did that was so much different on this trip was, I'm, I'm just going to flat out say, I proved to myself and I approved through Uplay how to leave sustainable disc golf education, meaning coaches doing it in front of our eyes. My favorite teaching day ever. Raven already told the story about going to the island and we were, we were on display. We were the Mzungus. Mzungu is the white person okay. and the Mzungus were kind of a big deal and like exciting. They wanted to touch our skin. They wanted to, Actually, one kid pulled a hair out of the back of Dustin's leg because they were like, whoa, <laughs> Dustin's like, oh, my God, I just got bit by something. And really, the kid's like, <laughs> you know, like, you guys have hair on your legs? This is crazy. You know, it, but that's a funny note. But it's, it's the sustainability of watching coaching happen in front of your eyes and working better than – anything I've ever seen in the United States. I'm super proud of our, our touring pro ambassadors and I'm super proud of places like Alaska. We, we've spent um, three different years going back to and really loving on the Southeast Alaska area. We've been to Haines, Skagway, all over Juneau. And now we're having coaches there after two years of it and in the third year, now take it upon themselves to go somewhere else and teach without us whereas right in front of our eyes after you know we're on the eighth day and i'm watching it in swahili which is the only um universal universal language out of uh, over 130 i think which is crazy for one country <laughs> and i'm watching it unfold and i'm i gotta kind of back up and get a little animated here my birthday African dress mm, but uh, when you're watching people like show flat like a plate don't spill the food and this is for putting and driving this is what we want to do for every you know they're doing the show, body showing motions the grips and, like, and all the stuff that we <laughs> literally did with them yeah they were showing yeah. fan grip and power grip and yeah. like split. in in the proper order too. yeah like, yes like, the UK wow. yeah. teaching methods which yeah. are proven we have more than just proof of concept in in the way we teach in the format that we teach in the safety in the why you have to say this and do this first um i, I gotta bring up this one quick story from a community connect that i wasn't at that ella hansen was leading this year jim oates one of my heroes one of my homies best buds was like hey ella you ought to teach driving first uh-uh no freaking way there is reasons why we do not teach driving first and there are reasons why we teach putting and then backhand before forehand but all three mm -hmm. of those are the basics mm -hmm. you got to do it and the proof of concept is all in it mm -hmm. and I, it just kept showing itself over and over that like we're doing it and we're doing it right and we're doing it top notch and i know it's 
it's that way because of what I watched unfold and, and I got to witness right in front of my own eyeballs. And it even happened in Kenya as well. And it was, it wasn't as much um, what I would call educational hours spent with us, the coaches that we, we deemed now you play coaches there. They only got to take one training with us and then they got to separately besides Kevin Becker. He was at every single school he set up. That's the uh, owner of the disc golf course and Rimpa Estates. Yeah. Wildlife Conservancy. Kevin was there for everything. So he got this massive training. But what is true when you go anywhere? And I think we we really now know more about what what we accomplished and what to do better from Guatemala is that you absolutely need a native of the culture on the ground mm. being one of the project drivers. And we okay. had a lot of expats in Guatemala. We had a lot of, you know, us folks that had moved down there and there's a difference even if they can speak the language there's a difference in trust there's a difference in why why should we even let these white folks come in and do this and it's it's like super important those these are valuable lessons we we worked and understood more about and learned more about community leadership what does it mean and then communication, like barriers and boundaries and like how to move past those things. Because there was a lot of missed communications that we had to work through during the trip. It was awesome. It was so, again, personal growth, huge for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just the fact that, you know, and Chandler kind of touched on that was the idea of being there and having some of those experiences just so that when you do, go, you go back, not only does he act as a little bit of a conduit and a middleman to some degree, but then just how much the productivity can increase and knowing a few of those ins and outs and, you know, pitfalls or challenges, having some of that knowledge and that background. And I know you said, you know, having a native person there as well, being a, a as ambassador and go between, and then you have some of these experience people that have, you know, are returning like a Chandler, I think that just kind of expedites everything. Not that you're in a hurry, but mm -hmm. it expedites everything and moves it along and makes it so much more impactful and, uh, you know, an official. I, one of the thoughts I just had was, what are, you're teaching these people and clearly they're picking up and soaking it up like a sponge. You're teaching the teachers and you're teaching some of the students. What are some of the what are some of the things that get left behind some tangible or not, you know, obviously you have your book, uh, like what are some of those things that do get left behind it to, to help either reinforce or to, you know, continue the education? Um, is there anything you can physically or tangibly or not leave behind? You want to start? Uh, yeah. Well, like, we gifted every place we taught five starter sets and a curriculum book. Okay. And, um, and gifted them the experience of watching us teach. So like how we set up the field prior to any students coming out, how we um, shift from putting to driving, mm -hmm. like the little things that Zoe and I have been doing are second nature now mm -hmm. for years that like you don't really understand until you're in the thick of it and you have 200 kids being kids running around chaos and like <laughs> yeah. knowing when to stop when it's not <laughs> safe, knowing when to go and when to give feedback. And like one thing we always do is line up coaches in between lines so the coach can give one piece of feedback to every kid mm. and so not over clouding their brain with information letting disc golf just come naturally give them a couple tips and then being the demonstrators like it really helps if your coach understands how to throw or understands at least how to talk about it um, in a professional way so those are like the main things that we always really focus on the properties that we go and teach at. Okay. Yeah, he just called it honestly. It's it's the ability with equipment. It's the ability with the book as your guide, and really, it's so hard to put this into like a, a little box and say it's the hours of experience watching us do what we do just without even thinking about it. Coaches, true teachers and true community leaders 
really soak up the things I don't even think about anymore. And, and when they ask questions, you know, they're soaking it up and they all did. It yeah. was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Having the countdown, I got to yell out three, two, one for hours. Three, two, one, <laughs> three, three, two, two one, throw. throw. And over yeah. and over and over. And like, think about that though. That, That's... that count is everything. Like the kids start waiting, like they won't throw if they're, I don't hear the throw or the count. And, and so it really helps control the whole classroom, especially when you're first showing these groups what disc golf is. And think about from your first experience. And I know years ago, I've been on this podcast talking about it. I coach this in personal lessons and private lessons. But I talk about a rhythm and a routine on the tee pad, on the fairway, and on the putting green being the most important. And we're starting them with a rhythm routine hmm. just by the countdown. Not to mention number one, most important safety. <laughs> so that's yeah. Uh, and, and I think that that has to be in itself, as you're saying, so fulfilling in that plenty of people find disc golf, they go out and they may never either have the gumption or the guts or, or even the interest in talking to somebody that's better to get some official uh, pointers or tips or training. And here, like, it's like, I don't know, like fresh putty, untouched putty, right? Like you're, you're able to like get them off on the right foot with some of these incredible basics and knowledge and background, like right off the bat from like the very first day they touch a disc. Just think about all the terrible habits we all have uh, that you start out with. And then, you know, when, when somebody comes along and you get that instructor that fixes it, they have to break you and then fix it. You guys, you guys have fresh putty. Right, from day one. Yeah. That's got to be exciting. <laughs> and I think Chandler mentioned just how serious, seriously these, these guys are going to elevate and we are going to see the first thousand rated Ugandan, Kenyan, maybe Zambian, Zimbabwean, if that's how you say it, Ethiopian, um, South African. So the African Disc Golf Federation has officially been started. Okay. Blossomed. Trip, although Johannes from Ethiopia mm -hmm. already had a bunch going, James Koizumi took this like side little trip, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, in a little bit, over to Zimbabwe. And then he met so many of these really important continental community leaders that he was like, man, I'm going to go ahead and just connect them all right now on WhatsApp. And everywhere I just named, including Johannes and people from Zambia that I've never met, that Dustin Leatherman and Eagles Wings have mm -hmm. originally started working with prior to the pandemic, you know, years ago. I think that was 2016, 17. They're all connected now, and this is the African Federation. So let that one just kind of resonate and soak in for a minute. And then the very first ever recorded and documented Zimbabwe Disc Golf Association meeting took place with 17 members. There's, there's 20 deemed coaches, but let's think about this. There's not even a course yet in Zimbabwe. There's one traveler basket and 125 discs. And they're showing it by throwing and putting at a tree and celebrating and people around are like, whoa, what are they so excited about? I want to go try. <laughs> so they're, they're already teaching and it's not, it's, it's every place we just were. We have proof from our messages, proof from videos, proof from texts and, and scorecards that they're already implementing the teaching and it's it's already happening so much faster you know sometimes in the united states on the community connect with the disc golf pro tour i'll get an email six months later or maybe three months if i'm really lucky within the next week and that's what i'm always hopeful for that the teacher is implementing it in mm. pe mm -hmm. i don't always mm. get those emails but they do have the resources by far and they do have the book and so to know just how serious and how responsible every one of these African coaches feel for this and holding the torch and keeping it going is like, it's the best thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sport is a really big deal in Africa. And I'd say like one of the coolest things was the East African Games that is like their Olympics. It happens every other year. And they had 16 uh, disciplines that were part of the East African games. And when we were there, they brought us into the room and the Dean sat us down and he's like, I'd like to tell you all that we have officially introduced disc golf as the 17th discipline. Wow. And so like yes. these schools, these uh, students of these universities can now train 
And if you place in the top three, you earn tuition or a percentage of tuition off your off of your cost of school. So mm-hmm. like there's disc golf scholarships happening. There's like training for free or cheaper education. And it all started by PMF putting baskets in the ground and then us coming to teach the masses. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, I- I know this is going to be a, I would assume this is going to be tough to answer, but is it going to be easy to expand outside of Africa and all these places you just mentioned? I mean, Chandler, and I say that because Chandler, I think feels like he's really found his niche and, and his territory, so to speak, and, and where he wants to be. Do you guys have hopes of this being in other various continents and places, or do you feel like you're already like finding the you know one of the most obvious paths with where where you're headed right now? I mean, how how do you decide? <laughs> well, yeah, the talk about what well, well, you and James talked about. Yeah, yeah, well, we are you know I feel like you plays in position as now like the global leader. Uh, we 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 understand how to grow it. And, you know, one thing I told the board in our last board meeting is like, we're, we're not just teaching disc golf and we're not just using disc golf as like the end all of what we're doing. It's like, we're inspiring these people to become their own community leaders. And like the community leaders that are our project hosts are choosing other people they feel are responsible to step up and take a bigger role, let's say in media or web development or associations, any any of those things. So it's like we're just using disc golf as our vehicle to like mm-hmm. just better our whatever we can put ourselves in front of. And you know, there's so many places that disc golf is not there yet. So I think you know, I I already have gotten multiple messages like, hey, please come to Southeast Asia. Please come to, you know, Europe, Europe is developed, but there's Mm -hmm. still so many countries that don't have it yet. And, you know, we, we still have plans on going, you know, PMF's building a course in Nicaragua, there's a course in Colombia that we haven't been to yet. And like, South America is somewhere the North, you know, people in North America can get too easy. Mm -hmm. Whereas like, you know, it's kind of hard for us to get to Africa. It takes it takes a lot of resources and a lot of time, but like if we inspire people, Zoe's working with people in Finland, and it's e- much easier for them to get resources down to Africa. So like just kind of bringing the world together and using disc golf as our like inspiration behind it, you know, it, it's unlimited, really. And I think Dustin nailed it on the last part, especially like the United States can't be responsible for the entire world. I don't think we all have the most money. There is lots of money and lots of disc golf in European cultures and communities and potentially even Australian. And so to connect the third world countries to the closest, most available disc golf funding and resources Mm -hmm. also, I feel like is you plays job now. I mean, we're we're already doing it and it's already working (laughs) and there's, already a planned collaboration with two world organizations that are going to go help take more disc golf to Zimbabwe. It's insane what's happened since we've been back. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I I want to, just for the sake of full clarity, uh, you guys especially have gotten very accustomed to saying PMF. And in case anyone is not crystal clear, Paul Macbeth Foundation, uh, again, it, knowing how much they've done and continue to do, as we've talked with them and had them on the show multiple times, uh, I want to give full credit so everyone knows that uh, that's exactly who you guys have been referencing. And uh, I, I know we've mentioned them a number of times, but I want to make that very clear. Well, how, how did, maybe even stepping into that for a moment, though, how did that relationship come about and um you know is, is is there like an exclusivity there or uh you know because they're they're going everywhere to put in incredible courses and to make these opportunities how did that partnership for you guys kind of come about oh man super organically so literally 
it's our first year on tour together in 2013. And we're over on the East Coast playing an A tier in Maryland. Maryland, yeah. And we get put on a card. The only two FPOs, Hannah Leatherman and Zoe Endike, mm. Dustin Leatherman and Dustin Keegan being our significant others. Mm-hmm. The tournament director just decided we could play on the first card together, yada, yada, so on and so forth. So a real a, a relationship, a friendship started that day. And then you go down the road and, and – my investment or my like following of Eagles Wings is is huge. I, I really, I really love the work that they're doing. Mm-hmm. And Dustin Leatherman is a big leader in Eagles Wings. And then um, fast forward a little bit further, you play gets started in 2017. We become established, and Dustin Leatherman continued to reach out to me, continued to be a personal donor, continued to care about our work. And then when Paul Macbeth Foundation becomes established, it was like not even a question as to who their educational sustainability partner would be because he had read our book or at that time, I guess it hadn't perfectly came out, but he was familiar with some of our methods. Mm-hmm. He was familiar. He, he knew my passion. Like I would say Dustin Leatherman as the executive director knows me through and through as a human as as I do him and the connection personally made for the professional relationship to get started and the improvements on our both of our nonprofit organizations relationship is like incredible so from Guatemala you know we we got started we did some good work I think that there are some big areas of improvements to be made and we can now follow up and continue to support the Guatemalans but this African trip, from communication to from the time P- Paul Macbeth Foundation goes on a build and gets back, the day they get back, the new plan is hand over the communications of every project driver if we haven't met them so that we can start planning. Because in this African adventure, I actually didn't have my first video meetings or phone calls with anyone on the ground until... Oh, weeks. Yeah, yeah, well, it's it was probably a month or a month and a half, and, and that wasn't enough time, even though you re- you've read this report, which, by the way, will be published as a blog on youplaydiscgolf.org. I'm trying to send it to all our partners and ask them to send to their email lists. And, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to scream this impact report out to the mm-hmm. world because news stations sh- should obviously pick it up or very obviously, like, be sharing the info because it's so happy. But back to the whole relationship, um, understanding how much more you can accomplish with more communication that's direct, more communication that has, well, what do you think we should do here? We want to teach. We want to get a school. We want to do this. No, 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 no. We want to establish community leaders. And then instead of me, my whole entire life, I've, I've been like, yes, I can do it. Put my name next to the job or the workload. I'll do everything. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'm smarter now because I know I can't do everything and I know Dustin does different things better than I do or is more well suited for certain things just like everyone on our team was Mm -hmm. Chandler was such a key role in a different type of understanding how it really went Raven was so patient so collected and so good at letting us know like the not so great things you know like hey I'm uncomfortable I've got this like flu I Mm-hmm. probably you don't want to do this or that but like it's 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 understanding for me where my strengths are and where my weaknesses are and then building a team of people that can fill in on my weaknesses and then making sure that teams are properly built like that with the most possible lead time from here on out yeah i uh clearly <laughs> There's a, a component of wanting to be in charge and getting stuff done. And then clearly what makes for an even better leader is one that can delegate uh, delegate and recognize where those people are best suited and who they are and having that team that you're building and having those uh, just experienced uh, components all come together uh, is clearly what is going to continue to make you strong when uh, you know, a good question on the board that is kind of in line with where I was going to go next is did, did you, as you're developing, you play, and as you guys are working on it, 
was an international component, was that a goal? Was that something that you were initially even concerned with or, or did, did that relationship with like the foundation and all that other stuff just seem uh, to fit perfectly? I mean, was, was international relations uh, a major driving force for you when you're starting Uplay? I'm going to start on this one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So first ever like board meeting and when we created our mission statement and purpose, I absolutely said inside of the mission statement, people all over the world, mm. but I absolutely in my heart and in my head kind of didn't really think that was ever going to happen in my lifetime. I thought if I can make it across the 50 States and maybe up into Canada, you know, Shout out Ben Smith. <laughs> Shout out James Koizumi. You know, Canada has been been huge and instrumental in my understanding that I could um, go across international borders. Sure. But I I was scared, Terry, right before I went to Guatemala. And I also had a strange amount of fear in my heart before I went to Africa that have just dissipated and like gone away. And from what was in the dream board being in the goal board, being into reality, all happening so quickly, like dreams really do come true. And I, I did say it, even though I may not have believed it in the beginning. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this time or in November of last year, we had only ever taught in the U S and in Canada. Mm. And now we've taught in nine countries <laughs> and in one year. And mm -hmm. it's just been just, all right, we're global now. Boom, let's go. And <laughs> yeah, you know, so once we're going, it's like we're going. It's so, national, we'll baby. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> then, so then, what moves? I mean, y you had your, you know, your dream board, which is now a reality board. What's on the dream board? Like what you've seen that what's possible? What's next? Like if you could do something okay. else, like what was that? Oh. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, yeah. to do it better and to become more and more effective and mm. even more efficient. This impact report blew me out of the water that I even got to write it in my lifetime. And now I know we can do it even better. And I'm still just like, this is the best trip we ever. But I know every time you, you do something, you gain that experience or that repetition, just like hundred putts a day for a hundred days or whatever it is you want to call it and compare it to in disc golf, the more training and the more experience after a thousand hours, you become this. And after a hundred thousand hours, you become this. Well, after each one of these trips, the professionalism bar is raised and I don't have the sentence on the dream board. I just know that we can do better everywhere. We can always do better. Yeah, we really figured out our lane uh, in a way okay. to say it this year. This this year especially is like, you know, we used to always just, you know, teach any way we possibly could and keep doing stuff until something fit. But we were going too many directions sometimes. And so That's now, funny. like, we really have understand what we're really good at and just hone it in, make it the best we can possibly do. Just like when we first started playing disc golf, training as pros, you know? So it, it's coming full circle as disc golf players do. Really cool. uh, and that leads me to my next question, which is both of you playing, touring, you know, uh, uh, a very uh, crucial role at the early beginnings of the Disc Golf Pro Tour uh, in setting up and traveling and being part of that. And media uh, now. And, and all of that stuff. <laughs> and media, of course, course design. W where does this put both of you in terms of spreading out your availability and any other goals or aspirations or things you're looking, I mean, is, is playing disc, disc golf on the tour a concern to either of you? I'll let you go first. <laughs> yeah. I, deep down, I, I know is like the quick, easy answer because I know like the amount of work it takes to be a touring pro. And when we started integrating you play work, my touring and playing skills <laughs> kind of went down or I just didn't, 
not necessarily skills went down. I just didn't have enough time to practice. Mm -hmm. And like, in a way, you have to really commit to playing disc golf if you want to be on the top. And, you know, fighting and grinding to place 20th or 30th isn't the most enjoyable. That's a hard work. That's a, it's a grind, to say mm -hmm. the least. So when we really, you know, I realize, you know, watching, being part of the pro tour and watching it grow. And now there, you know, there's going to be qualifying series. And it's like, I don't have a touring card anymore because I didn't play last year, really, you know, and hopefully I can get some exemptions from being a designer of the Portland Open and tap in every once in a while because I'm still a great player. And I'm, when we play, it's like, oh, I still impress myself. I'm still getting better. We teach all the time. And when you teach, anyone who teaches no, as you teach, you just get better. And so, like, we don't stop playing disc golf. Like, that that's not something. we don't, It's not like we're not playing. We're just not training for the tour. It's mm -hmm. different. And so, like, it's not a concern to be the best or try to, like, make make my way up the world rankings or anything like that. But if if we can leave a lasting impact, you know, at, you know, so we just turned 40, I'm 37. It's like, you know, these kids that are winning are 18 to 25. I, you know, you got to keep it real at some point. And so just knowing the place and, you know, doing what we can to leave, leave the sport as good as we can is kind of the main focus. Yeah. Us. It's amazing. It's amazing how quickly you can realize your place in the sport. Like I think all of us at one point had aspirations of being maybe not a touring pro, but a solid pro player that maybe can make a living or, or regional tour. And at some point you just realize that's not where I'm best suited. Some people are best yeah. suited teaching. Some people are best suited uh, being a manager. Some people are best suited behind a keyboard. Some people are best suited in front of a microphone. It's, it's no offense, Terry. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a top, I'm a top notch troll. I, I, I can do that better than anybody. If I have but to, it, it, it's amazing how, how quickly you can be, you can realize where your place actually should be and be happy with that. You know, you don't have to be, yeah. not well, like everyone's going to be Paul <laughs> talking about the young players. It's like Zoe and I put the first disc into Cole Dolan's hand and then he won Ledgestone this year. And like, it's insane. It's like you plays already teaching potential world champions and the future of our sport. So it's like, just realize what we're doing and, you know, keep it going. And like Zoe said, keep doing it better and better. Well, I, yeah. And with that, I just feel like a lot of people feel as if there's this really narrow minded mentality of like, well, if you're not winning, like winning and playing is the number one goal and aspiration. And it should be for every disc golfer. And clearly it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be because you have other skills and, mm -hmm. and tools. And, and to be honest, if we didn't have all these other people doing a lot of other jobs really well, no one's it, making a living on that. No tour. one's <laughs> making a living when you are winning in an event, right? Like if, if we don't have, if all these quality people aren't in their, you know, defined, uh, roles, then uh, yeah, yeah, the whole shit. I was grinding sink. out 2016, setting up the pro tour with Steve Dodge. Like, mm -hmm. like we, you know, we were, oh, we're gonna be the pros on the pro tour, but we had to set up every, all the games oh, and yeah. like the whole. We set up all the OB, the whole course, all the flags, like everything. It was four of us: me, Zoe, Paul, uh, Paul Owen, and, and Shasta Chris. Yeah. And oh, I like, know. Yeah. There was no time for us to practice no. by the time the tournament started. <laughs> I remember that was a bad uh, idea from day one. <laughs> that was, yeah. that was, but but she, we were all there for it in in our own yeah. ways. Shasta told me, Zoe, the answer is always no. If anybody wants to do anything with us or play disc golf with us, you have to say no. You can't say yes to anyone. And I was like, that was, that was a hard driven point um, that I finally started to pick up by like the tour championships the first year. Yeah. Uh, well, wanna... uh, and now Shasta's uh, lounging, winning tournaments over in uh, Malay Thailand, Thailand as we and speak. Malaysia. I don't uh, know. He won last weekend. So congrats to Shasta. Uh, Shout out Shashi. Okay. For and me, so for you, Zoe, yeah. What does, what does yeah. your career path continue so to look like? My list of priorities is that I'm absolutely the executive director of Uplay and a, and a totally full spirit 
teacher, positively motivating teacher first. And this year, I this was the second year I had the chance to be a Disc Golf Network commentator. I really, really, really enjoyed it. I loved the thousands and thousands of messages from people, you know, motivating, critiquing. Even some of the stuff that was like, hey, Captain Positive, you're too positive. You can't be that positive. <laughs> those are really awesome things for me to hear because I can make those balances and those changes. You know, some stuff you just have to ignore because there's no, not really room for yeah. jerks yeah. in the world, in my world, but there's a lot of jerks out there and it's okay. Mm -hmm. But what I want to say about Disc Golf Network is, and, and actually the Disc Golf Pro Tour as a competitor is that it is more important to leave a lasting impression on the on the rest of history for the sport. It's more important for me to teach, but just like at the Ostrich Open, playing, getting a chance to play competitively for my first time ever with Raven Klein. I ain't gonna lie, I was like, oh God, she's gonna kick my booty. Like, wonder what's <laughs> gonna happen. And we were going shot for shot. There was a few things that actually happened in the round that Raz Raisin, Raven, <laughs> Raz Raisin. Um, and, you know, I kind of felt for her, but it was absolutely when I took a birdie and she took a bogey. There was a two stroke swing when we were going shot for shot. And then I capitalized. I shot a 10 down when Chandler, also known shot as an, Dembe, yeah. and we'll talk about his nickname in a minute. Um, when Chandler shoots his 19 down, Zoe Andike comes back and, like, the competitor got to just set the teacher down and play. And it makes my heart so incredibly happy. I'm a ferocious competitor. I've only ever done sports my whole life. Sports kept me in school. Sports are the reason for my everything, you know, but it's mm -hmm. because of what sports do. And it's because of, it's because of the life lessons and like the natural core values that just sports in general bring that I, that I love them so much. And I do want to pick one to two masters events. I do still have a dream of being a world champion and that can be as a 40 plus year old world champion mm -hmm. fp40 mm -hmm. and if i ever do get the chance to play a disc golf pro tour again i will jump so fast at that opportunity because i can compete with the top touring fpos and i i love that but saying no is is a much bigger priority and actually having a weekend off to reflect on my week, which <laughs> has almost never happened in the last 12 years, mm -hmm. having an off season to reflect on what I just accomplished, which is going to be the month of December and maybe two weeks in January. That's my off season this year. And then I'm right back into it with teaching. Um, but I want to, I want to give a big shout out to Henry Pearson and Simon Feasy down in New Zealand for organizing the tour down under because I got this phone call and, and this message from Simon that said, hey, would you consider the tour down under? We want to bring you play events there. Mm -hmm. So then we got on this call and we organized it like, just like a lot of the initiatives that we took care of in Africa. We're going we're gonna to absolutely take, I'm going to take you play. Dustin's going to stay, which is <laughs> sad and hard for me because I want to share everything in my life with Dustin always. Mm -hmm. But he's got to hold down the fort here while I do even better hopefully than I, than I did in Africa down there. And then I want to share this. I was like, Simon, what kind of commentary do you want me to do? Like that, that would be the weekend. Right. And he's like, Zoe, I love your work ethic, but I want you to play. Mm. And so I'm going to feed my soul. I'm going to feed that wow. competitor at the tour down under maybe, maybe hit the Tim Selensky this year. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm probably going to say no to a few disc golf commentary jobs, because you play is the first priority, but I absolutely can't wait to balance some disc golf network jobs after setting you play schedule. And that's the most important thing to me. And I've never been able to, to say no to things that I love before. And, and that's a new skill that I'm exercising and practicing and it feels good. Yeah. That balance and, and, in a, in you know that this this uh, is completely applicable to you that when when you're in the 
disc golf is like the busiest city in the world or the busiest intersection in the world. And some days you look up and it's like, Hey, there's a bunch of green lights going down this alley. And that might be commentating. And the next day you pivot and there's like, Oh wow. But I can see eight blocks down a green lights of playing. That's where I feel like I need to be. And then maybe it's course design or directing or running a putting league at a brewery. And like there's you, you, you both have your hands in so many different aspects of disc golf. And then when you're in this crazy intersection, you're looking up like on any given day, it feels like it could change. And some of it's so gratifying, but at some point you're like, I, I can't, I can't go down every one of these roads. Cause if I sprawl too much, I'll never get down any of them. And that's right. how I've kind of looked at my, my career in, within the sport. And I feel like you guys know that all too well. And then some, because you have your, you know, your, your sprawling in so many different ways. So I understand what you're saying. And, and at the end of the day, all four of us here, like we fell in love with disc golf initially from playing before disc golf media even existed. We all, yeah. fell in love. there was a magazine. Yeah, there was a magazine, uh, but we all fell in love with playing, with competing, with hanging out with friends. Uh, with having, you know, those conversations and, and adding up scorecards at the end of the round, you know, all those other crazy things that happen. And so to feed that uh, makes perfect sense. And, you know, like you said, Dustin, once in a while, if you can get play into an event and get an exemption and Zoe um, finding ways to play in different events uh, completely, you that's like that that is just this amazing uh refueling and maybe you need it once yeah. a year maybe it's twice a year but you need that refueling to like that's where we're grounded from right that those are our roots for all of us and uh i, uh, I love the that, players still need that. To play. i think yes. about that round after uh disc golf commentary in right there in milwaukee where i got to play disc golf with you and johnny v and brian and Lindsay. and first of all seeing you guys throw a disc like of course I know that you've been playing double the amount of time I have, but like, I didn't know I was ever going to get to see that. And the reason why I'm even sharing that story is because the player has to play. Like you can't let the passion completely be overtaken by the work because I'm so passionate about this work. I need to play in order to be my best at work. Yes. And that, 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 that serves as like filling your passion cup or taking your time off to do you. It's funny that disc golf is every category virtually for me and everything, but it is, it is meditation. It is time off. It is exercise. It is my happiness. And so I, I really, in order to be my best teacher or commentator, I got to play a little bit too. Yeah, you do. <laughs> T Swift once said players going to play, play, play. No. Okay. All right. I didn't think you'd get a T Swift reference. All right. Everybody so actually we, did. I think, I think world, everybody thought they were going to get one. <laughs> the world, we all know we could, we could probably, we could do a 24 hour stream talking about uh, all these amazing things, but we, in, in the, the sake of wrapping it up and letting people know that they clearly must go read the impact report, which as you said, is going to be released. Read the impact report. And I know we had some people asking the, the U disc, you, you play, I'm sorry. Yeah. The U play disc golf basics the fundamentals of how to teach is out on amazon you can go get it there just go to amazon and look for you play you will find it it's the first you know it, it's right there that's how you can get the the uh the curriculum right there that's how you well, do unless it. you do you have an additional and or better way that's mm -hmm. one way is there another way you guys recommend or is that the easiest you can go to our website it's okay. the yeah scroll down a half a page and sure. it's the second link okay. on our website yeah perfect and it will take you then amazon there. then bezos doesn't get a cut yeah i like it right <laughs> it is important to to recognize um on amazon you might see something that says sold out that would be the first edition mm, that is okay. no longer available but some for some reason amazon won't let you take it down okay and i know this because somebody very privy and savvy to professional disc golf just tried to buy a copy for a pe teacher and was like <laughs> hey i thought you should know it says sold out i'm like oh no that's the first edition so look for the outdoor photo copy yep. because the indoor photo copy yep. is johnny will put it up on screen for everybody yeah. as a yeah, reference that's the one. It's right there. That's the yeah. one. it says right on their <laughs> second edition uh, and as you said, you're working on the, the third right now. So uh, yeah. before we let you go, uh, I need 
uh, funny, quirky, crazy anecdote or story or something uh, that you either shared together or had separately on your trip before we let you go. Uh, let's end with a, some kind of funny other I, the hair pulling on your leg was pretty funny actually that's that's maybe, pretty not funny. That was like, <laughs> maybe not for you maybe not for you but, but uh, uh, I talk about that. <laughs> give us give us but, something uh silly crazy uh zoe maybe you want to talk about the picture that uh that you you had sent or referenced uh saying how well, cool it was cool, but no i want to i i already kind of led into it um dembe dembe is chandler mm. and that's okay. his Ugandan nickname. Okay. Dembe means peaceful and it means so much more to to all of us now, but to, to those people and and Dembe was his given and chosen nickname and I thought that was really special and mine was Swinya. 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 And it's Is that happy. I was gonna say smile, <laughs> but happy. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that seems uh perfect. Fitting. Uh, yeah. DK, Dustin, do you, did you get, uh, did you get one as well? I didn't get named actually, but everyone called me Kitty, like always. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's, it's a universal uh, nickname that <laughs> crosses goes, all borders. It goes beyond languages. <laughs> uh, that's, yes. that would have been my guess as well. I love it. All right, guys. Uh, w- what are the best ways? that people obviously they need to read the impact report obviously they need to keep on top of the paul mcbeth foundation as well as the you play site but what are the best ways that people can and should directly uh support you play and, and you plays efforts yeah thank you terry um our december fundraiser it is giving tuesday and uh, both raven and chandler were so kind to bring that up um but our december fundraiser officially kicks off today because it's my birthday so early but all month long is your opportunity and and you'll see all these different incentive levels for different donation levels and there's a huge raffle at the end of the month but what i want everyone to know is every dollar makes a huge difference you play is way down on our annual budget and it's because we haven't had all the time in the world to fundraise we're we're on the ground boots on the ground so from December fundraiser donations to in the middle of the year or late season when we do, we're, we're gonna try to turn Disc Golf Strokes, the art auction, into much more professionally painted art pieces with professional artists paired with professional disc golfers. Um, please, if you if you have it or you know somebody that, that might even have a few spare dollars, please support these initiatives because when you read the impact report, we're only going to do better and we're not going to stop. But to be paying to teach is is incredibly difficult at this point. We need to kind of zero out on the uh, the expenses that these types of huge impact trips make. So, again, just our fundraiser, our donate site. And before I let Dustin say something real quick, I have the hugest appreciation to give to the Paul Macbeth Foundation and to the PDGA for, for making my life's purpose so much more obvious and supporting it pmf and then pdga at the end there and uh, you know in the support factor and i only hope that organizations that have the funds and the means will partner with uplay to continue to make it possible because it is it is very very difficult at this time and can't stop won't stop is is what we're doing and strong army volunteers also if you have a skill we are lacking in media and marketing. Mm. There's a there's a, a volunteer, um, what's it called? Volunteer. Just a uh, sub, submission like, form. Submission mm. form, yeah, yeah, on our website. And we're looking to build the Uplay Angel Army of volunteers. And we need help with media and marketing so that everyone can understand these beautiful impacts. And then a big, huge, huge appreciation for the, the Disc Golf Pro Tour being our biggest and longest standing partner and you disc as well. And awesome. you guys. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I don't know if everybody knows about it. There's little things um, like the I, right now I'm running or helping our community here in Eugene run a winter series of their XC tiers. So there's no ratings. It can just be fun, but we see sanction them. And then we, applied for a, the endowment program from the mm-hmm. PDGA 
and you can donate fees to you play so anybody who wants to run a cool series reach out i can help you set that up and and you can just give back to you play not necessarily by donating your own personal money but your tournament series can give back to us in certain ways and the more you know the more tournaments and things that come in helps so much and we can help equip them yeah we can help equip with discs or swag or anything you need so sweet just reach out with if any inquiries you know about how to help out not just give us money always yeah, if you're is, feeling it if you're feeling it and you're good at running raffles good at running tournaments good at media anything reach out to us we we need your help and we want we want to help you use your energy awesome well yeah and i think that is that's such a great point and i'll i'll repeat it like it's not always just money there's so many other ways that you can be helpful and and lend a, uh, a helping hand and or just be part of an overall greater solution and have an impact um of course dollars dollars always are uh are, are the are easiest and yeah. easiest it's the easiest like, way if you to want grease the, the lowest wheels. effort uh attempt to the dollars go a long way but yeah like you guys said there's so much more uh that you can do to be part of it well guys we are so thankful uh, that you would be willing to sit down and join us on your birthday on your birthday zoe birthday. celebrating your 40th uh so happy birthday uh, again uh, in that regard thank and then thank you for just everything you guys did to give our first two guests the opportunities that they had and you know i said it to them as well as as with you guys just such in great uh, ambassadors to have representing I don't even want to say our country, just our entire sport and the fact that you guys can go there and go to these amazing places, these nine different countries in a single year. And wow. uh, I think it should put a smile on everyone's face that when we say, oh, yeah, there's somebody there promoting and introducing disc golf to the world. And when we mention you two at the helm, I don't know how uh, anyone couldn't just smile at the thought <laughs> of that. So we love you guys and uh, appreciate you guys for joining us. Looking forward to uh, 2024 and beyond. I, I want you both to just for a moment, as tough as it is, just relax, breathe, <laughs> right? Take in a, a few weeks as we close out 2023. Go get a nice dinner. Go yeah. treat yourself to a really nice dinner. All that stuff. Yeah. Just, uh, just yeah. take it all in. Uh, you guys have more than earned it and then some, and we already know you're going to be gearing up oh. in 2024. So, <laughs> All right, everyone. That is the kitty. Dustin Keegan, along with the birthday girl, Zoe and I, thank you. <laughs> we love you guys, and uh, have a good one. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, you guys. Right. See you guys. All right. You play. I play. You play. We, we all, all play. play. It's, it's honestly amazing to think of where just the sport in general has come over the last 10 years, but the – Nonprofit side of our sport mm -hmm. for the longest time it was edge mm -hmm. and that was and kind continues of, to be it continues to be but that was kind of it yeah as far as like a true nonprofit. now we have so many options there are so many people looking to give back to the sport you know it's it really is <laughs> i mean I hope it's not the uh, the golden age of disc golf. I hope we haven't hit that yet, but it is a really good time to be in the sport right now. Yeah, and just the fact that you can, whether it's the individuals or it's kind of somewhat company or affiliated uh, with someone that you align with or love or like or whatever, there there's actually multiple uh, opportunities to go about it and various ways you can support. And just off the top of my head, we mentioned edge of course, which has been around celebrating 20 years as of this year, uh, the educational disc golf experience you play, which has come up and done these phenomenal things, uh, in the last few years, the likes of the Paul McBeth foundation, the Ricky Wysocki, uh, foundation, uh, what Paul, uh, Uliberry is doing with his, uh, with his Academy and yeah. his, uh, his, uh, organization. Uh, those are just a few, again, a few of them, uh, most of which didn't exist except for mm -hmm. edge. Like you said, didn't yep. exist a number of years ago and there's going to continue to be more. I know dynamic has done stuff with veterans and prodigy has, and so on and so forth. Just all of the different organizations and, uh, and, uh, 
like you, like uh, Zoe was just saying, it is so much more than just about the financial perspective. Maybe your skill sets or your interest lies within something that they're doing, and whether that's sure. schools or something international, or you you just have a knack for doing one particular task really well that uh, they could you know use you as an asset. Unlimited potentials uh, that are out there. So you're right. I love it. So thank you to all of our guests. I, I don't know if, if you don't have a, that, that, a a big old warm smile in your heart a uh, after after tonight. I don't know. Uh, I, you must not love disc golf. So uh, again, happy birthday to Zoe. Let's let's talk about some nuts and bolts basics, and then we can close out the show, and then we'll have a, an after show shortly after that. Sure, I some mean basics from uh, yeah from the rest of the world. Some, a pretty quiet week in disc golf. Obviously, it's the holiday weekend with Thanksgiving that had just happened. But one of the things that was announced right before Thanksgiving, about a week ago, uh, on the twenty second, was something we were talking about last Tuesday. An update to the update, as the PDGA is calling it, for the Champions Cup date. Myself, just like a few other people, kind of nailed down that particular date. Uh, they're moving it to April 25th through 28th now. And it's staying at Northwood Park, which means we're going to see the mid-spring major in a northern state, which could be dicey, could be fun. Little, little roll of the dice. Yeah, I mean, we... Uh, I've, I'm old enough to, to say I've seen snow in May. Um, mm -hmm. I, At a disc golf tournament in Northern, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, all of that. So anyway, it is moving to April 25th through 28th. They say this is the last time it's going to move, that they've set the date. I'd bet otherwise. Okay, I'm just I'm not. I wouldn't. I think this is the date that it's going to be set at. Um, I am not going to place a bet whether it stays here, but I think it should. They've announced it. I think it's the right decision to move the time and date up earlier. I don't know about the park because I don't know the type of condition it's going to be in because we don't know the type of weather we're going to get. Mm -hmm. But I under I also understand how it would be very difficult to secure another location in the amount of time that we have. So we're going to see what happens. It's, after the Music City Open, but before the DDO, we're going to have a major. The early season major is happening. The Swedish Open will not be conflicted with this year. The European swing will be unabated so the pros can travel all they like. Wait till none of them do. <laughs> I, you're going to get a handful. That was and, my and, and to be fair, yes, it... Um... I'm not negating that that was a very significant conflict. Um, I, I just, I am curious to see it more what so. it looks like in terms of how many of our players will be going over there for an extended period of time uh, uh, versus what we were projecting that how much of a conflict that really is going to be. But nonetheless, this does seem now with all that being said, I want to quickly say, whether they loved it or not, and I did not get an official response to this or <laughs> an official capacity, uh, I'll say big shout out to the KC Wide Open, who's going to have to roll with the punches. They did choose that date. That was an eight year that they were putting on the schedule, yeah. and you you could blame them if they were a little bit frustrated. Um, I I don't know to what extent, but I will say uh, you know if that's. Uh, yeah, Jerry, or if that's the crew or whomever that is that's all going to be involved in hosting that. Um, hopefully you guys have uh, are going to be able to pivot in your best possible way, and uh, we well, certainly wish you the best. As I kind of said last week, the KC Wide Open is probably now going to miss out on a dozen top tour. I won't say top, a dozen touring pros. Uh, who who probably would have stopped and played KC because they because we've got some pe some pros that'll just play every week. Someone like a a, a Parker Welk who just seems to play every week. Or, it doesn't or matter. Gannon Burr, or possibly, Gan or yeah. Gannon. All, I mean, you're good. You probably would have got a dozen pros because there would have been some that maybe would have gone to one of the other events, one of the other A tiers. Just it does 
it's unfortunate because I think it will affect Kansas City as far as maybe if if they were going to get any spectators. I don't know if they were expecting any. I mean, just I don't see it as being a huge issue for the local uh, the local A tiers and Kansas City still five hours away. From Peoria. Yeah, I think it's more of just a planning perspective and an yep. inconvenience of we yep. put in. Mm-hmm. Now, in this case, we put in for our date. Yep. Uh, obviously, one that they opted for. Oh, yeah. It wasn't just you know picked out of a hat. They put in for a specific date, and now they're going to have to pivot. So I, uh, I don't know. If I'm Kansas City, I don't pivot. I don't. I don't think I need to. I think I just still continue to run a phenomenal event for like the 45th year or whatever it is this oh, year. I, I think that I think are they over gonna, 50? Uh, no, I was going to say oh. I think they're changing dates, but I, I don't oh, know are they? for oh. a fact. Well, uh, either way. So yeah. just recognize that that is unfor- It's an unfortunate casualty, and it, we said it last week. There's no perfect solution no one's, because yeah, of the way this is all unfolded. And with that, the coincidence of the PDGA posting today. That cutting has now started at the IDGC. Uh, they have officially started logging and uh, addressing some of the uh, the bug infestation in the you know the trees and everything else. I think they just posted that today. That logging has started out at the IDGC. So the course remains closed. All that other stuff. Uh, but that was the big concern is I think they were talking about having maybe even all the logging done by now and maybe even working on the new course. They posted today that I think the logging literally just started, so uh, or clearing or whatever you want to call it. So, um, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, and there were no real big events this weekend, except for except for the RPM presents the 2023 Australian Disc Golf Championships, powered by Disconnection. That's Disc Connection. Connection. Correct. Two words. Uh, Taking home the victory, Luke Bain shooting 29 under par, besting the field by 10 strokes over Andrew Fish. Yeah, making a return this year. I yeah. talked to him earlier in the year. and Going back to Australia. Yeah, so. Uh, Going back to Aussie. Him and, and uh, David Perry all nodded up. And Dylan Feldman, who I, I believe I've had on coverage before, uh, out there as well. Uh, over in the FPO division, uh, Jennifer Lan wins by seven strokes over Sarah Lee. Sarah Lee makes some good cookies. Mm, no, but she's a damn good golfer. I believe uh, that. I, I hung out How do you know she bit. doesn't make good cookies? You just said no. She might. She might be uh, a good golfer true. and make great cookies. That's true. She uh, she could. She's, uh, yeah. Uh, I met her at the Swedish Open <laughs> uh, or the Shaletfia uh, a few years ago. So that those are your MPO and FPO competitors. That, awesome. Uh, that played well enough for us to talk about them. Yes, and then I'm gonna quickly talk about real quick. Uh, and if you don't want to, if you want to wait for the footage to come out, it hopefully will actually be sooner than later. Mm. Uh, I ran. No, you didn't. I think I did. The Cold Turkey 18 presented by Dynamic Disc this weekend. Uh, big shout out, of course, not only our presenting sponsor in Dynamic Disc. Uh, I, I I will very admittedly say I have had a number of sponsors for different tournaments that I run. Uh, I think that we have a lot of great companies within disc golf. And I also, as much as I love to give, we'll say consistency and, and loyalty to any one company. I also love the idea from a playing perspective, from a player's perspective, it's not always just one brand that you're showing up and getting. So yeah. um, it was awesome to, this is the first time in a couple of years that I've worked with Dynamic Disc, uh, who was very gracious and kind to me, and I very much appreciate them. Uh, in open, if you don't want to wait for the video coverage to drop, I'm going to tell you open's winner. Who won? Jonathan Borsick, oh. uh, who's been on a little bit of a tear uh, per Locally. one of his social media posts nice. recently. Uh, Jonathan took it down. Uh, second place, Benjamin Pelotes, Pelotes and Andrew Lesanuski? I didn't get a chance to talk to Andrew, but uh, he ended up finishing in third. Side note to him, ace on hole 16 wasn't in the ace pool. Oh, which course? Hole 16. Uh, Gray Fox, Gray the Fox. straight ahead, yep. hole number 16. Um, and we unfortunately didn't have any FPO competitors. We at closest had Barrett White sign up originally and was ready to play in a uh, professional women's division. Had no other uh, professional women sign up, so uh, ultimately Barrett White went and played in MP50 
where she just barely uh, missed the cash. She finished in th third out of four. So uh, thank you to all the players. When it was all said and done, due to drops and whatever, uh, <laughs> we were at 68 for Saturday, and I want to say it was 69 or so for Sunday uh, with a max capacity of 72. Each morning when I woke up, we were at 72, and each morning <laughs> somebody got now, sick. Yeah. Now, to be fair, uh, just to also put this in perspective, Saturday was 30-ish and relatively light winds. Things were pretty calm, a little chill in the air. It was one of the colder cold turkeys we've had lately. Yeah. Sunday, Wisconsin saw its most significant snowfall of the year. And so Sunday was flat out nasty for a good portion of the day. There wasn't a lot of accumulation. It was just a. It was just. It was snowy constant and windy snow and constant and very damp. Yeah, and it made for an extra special chill in the air. I don't get chilled easily. Mm -hmm. Sunday was not great out there. So um, Sunday's conditions were in fact considerably worse, uh, so to speak. I believe but, that. Uh, one of the other cool things that uh, I'll post on social media because I now have it ready for us tonight. I had the pleasure of uh, teaming up with, and teaming up is even a strong way to put it. Um, some of you know drawings by Trent, and you've seen them either on Facebook or YouTube or probably more like TikTok or Instagram. And uh, Trent is a 23-year-old gentleman uh, with autism, and his whole family has uh, really rallied around the idea of creating autism awareness, obviously supporting um, Trent within the family. But then Trent has this incredible uh, talent of being handed almost anything on a, on a piece of paper, uh, any kind of description on a piece of paper, and then he instantly draws it out. And this is the main component of his entire social media presence. And I'll warn you now, it's a rabbit hole for hours. So <laughs> be prepared if you do this. And so you could say uh, he Trent might get, um, you know, a squirrel pulling a wagon. And then within 20 seconds, he sketches together a squirrel yep. pulling a, a wagon. It's wildly entertaining. It's awesome to see such an incredible talent. And Trent has then now created a couple of different characters and or uh, merchandise and wares that, of course, go to help support autism awareness and inclusivity and, and all this other stuff. And nothing more than the alg algorithms had brought me to seeing this probably a year ago for the first time. And it was at one random point when I ended up visiting his website, I saw you could make a submission. They do kind of... Uh, suggestions where they'll randomly pull like three out of a hat on any given day and he'll draw them. If you pay, they will do uh, as close to of a suggestion as you can offer. And, and there's um, some liberties that they could take. I thought it would be kind of cool to submit and pay. And I had submitted and said, knowing I run cold turkey every year, mm -hmm. submitted and said, I would like Trent to potentially draw me a turkey throwing a Frisbee. Um, sure enough, my su submission uh, got to Trent. They record a video of his dad saying, hey, somebody you know paid for a submission. He drew the turkey. They, they send me a hard copy of that, the actual drawing that he made. And then I turned that ultimately into a stamp. We then put that as the main stamp on the disc. Oh, I forgot I have one right here. Yeah, we put that as a main stamp on the disc. And then I also did a Dimax version, like which we colored, full color. a full color Dimax version. And those I'm selling separately. I have a few left. I'm selling those separately that are directly going to benefit uh, a, a place in which Trent attended school and uh, a facility in the Wichita area, uh, Heart Heart. Spring, I want to say is the name of it. Um, that's where we're going to make the donation per Trent's family suggestion. So this one is the hot stamp. And I'm going to put it right there. And so that's the drawing that Trent had. He didn't put in the DD logo, <laughs> but he did the rest of it. Uh, and then on the Dimax version, we left where he signs his name. I left that on there and we took out the, uh, the dynamic disc logo. But we put in there the um, Trent's name. Uh, which he had put on the original version. So I have those available. They're uh, $30 ship, $25 in person, and uh, all proceeds of that are going right to Trent. I reached out to his dad and said, hey, I, I would love to just tie this together. I don't have any personal 
ties to autism uh, in in a direct way. And then that's when he I said, where could we benefit? Uh, whom or where is there an organization? And that's when he mentioned uh, the school in which Trent went to. Yeah, it's called HeartSpring, and it's on heartspring.org. I'm going to put that in the description. And uh, he said, that's where Trent went. We then continue to have this conversation. His dad went on to tell me, my wife and one or two of his children have graduated from Emporia State University. His wife oh. is, uh, got her master's at Emporia State. And so he, they probably the, long enough ago, uh, they it, knew, they knew something about disc golf, but not, you know, they, they just know that Emporia <laughs> knows disc golf as we all know. And it's just, what, what a, what a beautiful tie. Uh, that's nothing more than a coincidence. But, um, and then when I shared it on social media this weekend, at one point, uh, the dad or the, the, uh, uh, account shared it and said, look at Trent's art on a disc. And it, it was, it was exactly one of these. So anyway, that's kind of a long winded story, but I, it was awesome to have this team and this collaboration and the amount of people this weekend that said, Oh my God, I, I know that account was awesome. Oh, like, that's phenomenal. I'm not introducing drawings by Trent to everybody. There's plenty of people that have known and watch his stuff and so to now have a direct tie uh, like we did for this, it's been uh, incredible. So heartspring.org, that's the website, uh, and that's the facility in which Trent had uh, been at. And so that's where we're going to be donating some of the all of the proceeds from any of the sales of those discs. So uh, awesome, awesome weekend. And also I think there was one ace pool that wasn't hit. So uh, that also will ultimately be able to go in that direction. So. Thank you to everyone that came out. Tom McManus, uh, a huge help as always. Reese was a big help. Ryan Pilcher, Dustin Skorpinski, uh, Tom Jenkins lingered around. He was there helping out a little <laughs> bit. Uh, just anyone that had any part of uh, helping out this weekend, I, I very much appreciate all of you guys. It was a very successful event when it was all said and done uh, for the 18th, 18th annual Old Turkey. All right. That's it. Oh, and one of the things they got, these new Disc Golf Rich light hoodie t-shirt sweatshirt things. There's a light hood. Great for layering, right? Uh, it's got long sleeves. We did these in both this like navy-ish blue and then in green. And I have a very select few that are leftovers. Uh, everyone got two discs, two custom stamp discs, a dynamic disc Sharpie, lunch, pizza and, and water delivered to them at during the lunch hour a towel and then this lightweight hoodie do you believe that value that's great. i don't either such a great value Terry. <laughs> it is all right it is time to call it thank you guys for joining us we're gonna have the after show we've got giveaways any guesses what it might be mm. any any guesses any I'm guesses i'm thinking some sort of pink dd disc uh, with a turkey on it i will see we'll See if there's any way we could tie this all together. This has been episode 482. Thank you so much, Chandler Fry, Raven Klein, Dustin Key, and Zoe Andyke. We wish you the happiest of birthdays and, and keep doing what you guys are all doing to kick ass. For Johnny VM, the disc golf guy, we'll take a quick break. We'll see you in the after show when you step inside the Smashbox. Thank you to our $2 and above patrons. Your name is listed below in the credits. If you are interested in being listed as a producer in the Smashbox TV credits and supporting this and other fine podcasts, please visit patreon.com slash smashbox TV.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smashbox TV Podcast 482's After Show. Nailed it. We did. I thought we did a pretty good job there, Tara. Yeah. Welcome to the After Show. If you're new here, the After Show sometimes can get off the rails, or sometimes it's right on point. It's always on point. It's just not always on the disc golf point. <laughs> or uh, or what's the point, maybe, is a better question. It's on a point. It's on what point it's, is it on? It's on a point. Well, here we are. So the after show is our time to, uh, well, possibly decompress, possibly get worked up, or uh, mm-hmm. dive into other subjects, topics, uh, things of uh, either pop culture and or uh, grander scale, or it could be 100% disc golf fodder and conversation. Either way, uh, there's no promises. Let's put it that way. Some people tune in for exclusively the after show and some people tune out exclusively because of the after show. Either way, that's what we're here for today. So welcome in everyone. I mm, great went to go see a comedian tangentially related to disc golfers. Yes, I was going to say his brother's a big disc golfer. Yes, I'm friends with I actually mentioned it to him that I'm friends with his brother on Facebook mm-hmm. and he's like, "Really?" I was like, "Yeah, all disc golf." And he's like, "Oh, yeah. He's he's uh, and I was like, "Yeah, he's pretty into it, right?" He's like he's like, "Yeah, you wouldn't uh you definitely wouldn't believe it." So I went to go see Pete Lee uh who internationally recognized Pete Lee. Internationally recognized Pete Lee, uh, originally from Janesville, Wisconsin mm-hmm. area. And now I believe lives out in California. He kind of talked about some of the stuff. It was in what they called an improv night, Mm -hmm. which it it was at the improv, but it was just a, just comedians for the most part. Uh, first comedian was good. He was fine. I mean, it's hard to tell when they, they get like 15 minutes, but, uh, real big, real big guy. Like, even half of his shtick was about his size. Mm. So that was fine. The second comedian, uh, I believe his name is Marcus Monroe. And the only reason I remember it is because he actually uh, grew up in Shorewood, apparently. Mm. He talked to... Which is nearby. Which is nearby. So Shorewood is literally 15 minutes up the road here, 15 minutes south of us. They introduced him. He comes on. He's a younger guy in a, I think, upper upper twenties. Or th- he's not the thirty eight year old that I'm looking at. That's a comedian. Yeah, that's that's definitely him. He's thirty eight. <laughs> yeah, thirty eight. Oh no, no, him. Sorry, his wife is in his upper twenties. He's thirty eight because he's talked about almost a, a, like a twelve or thirteen year gap. That's right. Oh, okay. So, okay, comedian. Nothing to okay. write home about. But the funny part was we're watching him. A couple chuckles here and there. Um. And then at, he's talking about how he, how he went to, he grew up and his dad was the principal at his school of this whole shtick. And, and, you know, then he mentioned, he's like, yeah, I was the, like the weird kid in Shorewood. My wife turns to me and goes, she says the words, Rick Monroe. And I was like, Rick Monroe. And then it hit me. My wife and I, our very Dating first. Dating a Rick Monroe. <laughs> no, weird. Our very first apartment. We rented from Rick Monroe. When I moved in with my wife, she was she rented the apartment from Rick Monroe, who was the principal at Shorewood where she did her internship. Mm. This guy was Rick's son, which and Rick Monroe actually ended up going to being the superintendent of the school my son's at now. This was years ago. I don't believe he's doing that anymore. But so I, I've met Rick Monroe a few times as he was our landlord. Uh, just a funny thing, because she looked at me, she's like, oh my God, that's Rick. Small world. She, my wife even said, she's like, we lived in the house where he was probably conceived. And I was like, ew. I'm like, yeah, we probably did. That's hot. <laughs> that's a little weird, but sure. That's. I know where your parents boinked. <laughs> I know where you were conceived. It was probably the room downstairs. Mm-hmm. Um, Wait, and you guys lived together before marriage? You I, your- I, I mean, barely. Barely. Ew. Ew. I know, Terry. Oh, gosh, ew. living in sin. And then Pete Lee comes on and he does an hour and a half set, which he even said was 30 minutes longer than he expected. <laughs> uh, for the most part, really funny. He did a, a a bit, which I thought lasted just a little too long, where he was asking the audience for drama. 
literally so like i love drama holiday weekends who here has holiday drama okay and they were it took a little while for the audience to warm up and so it kind of drug on for a little bit but mm -hmm. then some people are you know uh like oh my you know my sister-in-law uh showed up to this party with a new guy or mm -hmm. i think one of them was this this girl threw a party for her dad like a retirement party and planned it with his girlfriend of 14 years only to find out that her dad breaks up with the girlfriend the morning of the party <laughs> so though there was and the dad was there. So she she volunteered this info and there's dad <laughs> sitting next to her. Uh the dad uh, wouldn't the dad was not keen on talking he, about yeah, why he, he broke he up. Oh. <laughs> but he was there. He chuckled <laughs> along. But anyway, so afterwards, and the whole reason we, why we went to this, I invited you. Mm -hmm. You couldn't make it. Running a stupid tournament. Running a stupid tournament. The whole reason we did this is so my wife wanted to talk to Pete Lee about booking him for a fundraiser that her her office does every October. So trying to get ahead of it. We waited in line, walked around. Finally, we were like the last ones because we kind of stayed near the back of the line. We didn't want to hold anyone up if we were going to chat with him. And my wife talked with him and I was like, yeah, I'm friends with your brother on Facebook. And he's like, oh yeah, my brother. Uh, he's like, I was, I was touring with Bert. Oh, uh, right, sure. Yeah. yeah uh, like earlier, I think it was last year, late last year, earlier this year. Oh, I year. feel like it was just a... Was it earlier, it, was it earlier this I feel year like maybe? It was just even in the last few weeks but anyway but anyway so he's like he's like i called my brother and asked if he wanted to go disc golfing with bert and a bunch of guys from discraft mm -hmm. he's like and he's he's even like it's discraft right i'm like yes discraft <laughs> and so he said yes rob jumped at the opportunity showed up and he, this is what pete said pete's like he played out of his mind rob had the greatest day of his life <laughs> which is what you want to do maybe course, you want to show up and, of, uh, yeah he, he's like even rob said i'll never have a greater day in my life because i got to i got to play with bert i got to play with his brother he got to play with the discraft guys and he shot phenomenal out of his mind yeah and so <laughs> so pete was pretty excited that, that he got to share that and i figured i would share it here so everyone knows that rob you did have a great day everybody Atta knows boy it. rob wait way to show everybody up um and so that was my connection with disc golf. That was Sunday night mm. that we went to go see that, uh, the comedian. And again, if you get the chance, go see Pete Lee. Funny, definitely funny. Uh, yeah, I, I would be willing to bet um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with him by name alone, uh, if you saw him, you would recognize him. He's been in a ton of stuff, um, including being on Fallon a couple times. He's been a writer for a bunch of different stuff. He had, uh, uh, he was a cast member for Fuse TV's video on trial and the NFL's network's top tens. Uh, he was a cast member on VH1's best week ever. Uh, he made his late night television debut on the late show with Letterman, so on and so forth. He's been on a ton of different stuff. Um, so yes, we've always had this little backdoor connection and the fact that Rob is, is is actually helped me in orchestrating and running tournaments in that part of Wisconsin mm -hmm. in Janesville many years ago and then he always talked about his brother uh this uh, incredible comedian uh, so that's awesome so Pete Lee all about it well nice sounds like uh it was a good time and uh as I would expect yeah it was definitely um, good so and we're, my wife's not sure we have no clue she's going to reach out to Pete Lee and his agent, yep, which is what he directed us to do. But it's kind of funny because we were talking on the way back. We're like, I don't know how much she costs. <laughs> like, I don't know what, like, yeah, like, like what the price is. She's had other comedians. We had uh, Charlie Barons a couple mm -hmm. years ago, who is a very, very popular Wisconsin comedian. And he's he's a little bit he's starting to kind of delve out a little more nationally, but he's very much a, uh, a, a regional a, a regional shtick. Because it's very much Uper, Yadar Hay. Playing into Wisconsin, very Western much, stereotypes. Yeah, not quite Fargo if you watch Fargo, but very close. Yeah. Uh, that type of uh, humor. And so he he came and they, they paid, I forget, a couple thousand dollars to have him mm. there. But I was saying, I, I, don't, I don't know what Pete Lee would charge. Like, is, is that a $2,000 charge or a $10,000 charge? And I have no clue. So we're going to hopefully find that out um and, yeah i'd be curious just from a just a curiosity curiosity yeah, perspective here. what is like i said the same that thing. level of comedian mm -hmm. cost 
Yep. Uh, I mean, he is he's he's not a headlining selling out Madison Madison Square Garden type, but he's also not like you know working he's not your open mic night either. Correct. You know, he is uh, he's an know, established comedian. Yeah, so. exactly. And so. I had told my wife last year that they should look at booking him, but by then I think it was too late. By the time we had thought about it, it I think it was already like July. And the, the 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 thing was in October, so she was like, "Eh, that feels like too short of a span to call somebody and say, hey, you want to do this?'" So now we've just hopefully going to plan it for next year, which will be great. And if they can do that, you know, we're talking about VIP tickets, maybe get like a half hour a private show with Pete, mm-hmm. you know, for just some VIP people that pay more for their this this fundraiser. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited to see if we can get this moving along. Carney asks a question on the board. Have you been to the uh, Oshkosh Air uh, Show? Oh, come the, on. You can't E-A-A. ask a couple of Wisconsin boys that, especially ones that lived 20 minutes from the air show yes. as kids. Yes. So. Um, I've been there. Honestly, I think I've only been there twice. I was, wow, really? Yeah, yeah, I was there with my dad when we were when we were younger. And then in right after, no, it had to be during college. It was right during college. I went there with a girlfriend and, uh. and her brother. Did you live in sin with her too? No, I didn't. You dirty, <laughs> but I would have. <laughs> no, Jen Meyer, who worked, who you and I both know, we worked at Best oh, Buy together. Yeah. Oh, uh, Jen. Oh, Jen. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the a bunch of us, a couple of us uh, of her family and myself went to the EAA, but that's the last no, time I've that's been there. Twice only, really? I've only been there twice. My dad oh, used gosh. to go every year. He had you. There was a pin that you'd get that had the year on it, the EAA pin, and he'd go every year. And he had. 15 years worth of pins. I didn't go every year, but it was definitely far more than twice. But yeah. Okay. I like airplanes. I'll probably, I I really want to go in the next year or so because I want to bring my kids. I want to bring my son before he gets too old and wanders away because I don't think he's ever been. Um, And my daughter, I think, would have a a blast going there. Okay. Uh, Oh, uh, I want to, speaking of an airplane, I'm getting on one tomorrow. Where am I going? Uh, Probably. idea. Probably back to Arizona. No, that's a good guess, but wrong. Other side of the country. Well, Florida? <laughs> Florida. Gainesville. Okay. All right, I'm going to Gainesville tomorrow because on Thursday we're going to have a – I hope this, is, <laughs> this isn't this is exclusive news yet. I don't believe that it is. Uh, mixed double skins match it takes place on Thursday, and then the Cho, the Chainhawk Open, takes place Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'll be there again, uh, giving you guys some coverage. But uh, the doubles teams for Thursday is going to include Jessica Weiss and Double G, Deanne Carey, mm. AJ Carey, Holly Finley and Noah Five Ash, Sarah Hokum and Gavin Rathbun. So they're going to be right. playing double skins match. I'm going to be recording that. That's going to take place on Thursday. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, I believe we go Northside, Jonesville, Northside uh, for the three courses, just like we did last year. Okay. And Chain Hawk Open 12, PDGA A tier. Coverage coming at you. Keep the channel all week. Weekend. Uh, it should be next day in this case. Uh, this is the this is the event in a few funny instances. Uh, due to the timing and being on the East Coast, I actually was able to film, edit, commentate, render, and upload and get it out the same night. Damn! Uh, but I'm not going to... I found that there's not enough benefit to that. People weren't watching on, on the night I released it because everyone's so accustomed to watching the next morning anyway. So um, plan, hopefully plan for next day coverage. Not that I've set it up. <laughs> I'll have a, a challenge. But that's the plan this weekend. Next weekend... There's a conversation about trying to cover the Big Arm Challenge. Where is the Big Arm Challenge? That is in Arizona. It's in its fourth iteration. And you and I know, well, Vista from when the Phoenix Ladies Open happened, where it's in the shortest possible Vista format. Yes. We also know Vista in its XL format. Mm-hmm. For the memorial, that's the standard Vista most of you know from. Don't tell me coverage. Vista has a Wisconsin XXL. <laughs> they have a Terra Bear XXXXL. No, there is a Big Arm Challenge format. I don't know. I, I forget what probably the name of the I, I layout used, is. The, I, I got some big arms, like no, long, no, but um, not like that. Uh, I'm gonna try. And, mm-hmm. I, I want to say it's some absurd. Well, I'll tell you the absurd uh, nature. But, so this has seen the likes of uh, Anthony Barella winning it last year. I don't know how many years. Makes sense. Connor Rock, Jake Brown, Jordan Castro, Parker Welk, uh, 
Jacob Curtis, a.k.a. Cupcake, were all there last year. Drew Gibson was there last year. Uh, so those were some of the uh, players that we saw there last year. A lot of similar ones for this upcoming year. I'm going to quickly find you uh, the uh, AB won it last year. He had a 1083 and a 1069 rated round. And the holes come in at 10,614 feet. So it's not the longest course you're going to see in 2023 or 2024. But it's a long-ass course. But it's a long-ass course. And mm. it's Vista played in a way that you've never otherwise seen Vista played. And I think there's a lot of appeal to that in itself. That's cool. Uh, Jennifer Allen's managed to win this a few times. That's weird. Isn't it? Huh. <laughs> I know she's signed up playing FBO uh, this weekend as well. So, uh, or that weekend, next mm -hmm. weekend. So uh, we're trying to see if there's a practical way for me to get coverage. Um, we're looking for some potential sponsors uh, is, is the plug I'd put out there. So if you want to, support that coverage which i think will have some pretty good views uh with some of those big arms looking forward to it so chain hawk this weekend potentially big arm challenge next weekend the only other news we really have that we didn't touch on in the main show uh just some sponsorship news uh luke Lorenzen yep announced that she is leaving prodigy Okay. <laughs> she, she reached out to me for a favor and I forgot all day today. So I've got work to do when I get home. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm guessing she needs some footage or something. No, uh, but more important. This, oh. this is, I'm going to interrupt. This is more important. Okay. Uh, she, she uh, I, I hope this is public. She, she's applying for a visa, a, like a sports person visa, and she needs accredited sports media people to potentially help write like letters or recommendations and referrals. And she asked if I would be one of those people, uh, which I, honestly I'm just flattered about the thought of, uh, I don't like the idea of doing more work, but the idea of, of hopefully helping her, you know, follow her dreams and goals mm -hmm. and, and touring more. Um, yeah. And I think it's due tomorrow. So yeah. Yeah. You're going to want to do that. To be Tara. fair. She just asked me yesterday. Um, but I did forget about it entirely today. Well, so. I'm glad I reminded you Thank when mentioning you. that All right, she so is, now continue on with she with is leaving what may or may not matter, right? I, I mean, she she's leaving Prodigy. She might not be leaving the country thanks to Terry Miller. We don't know. <laughs> cool, you got a new sponsor. They're not gonna, we're not going to see you here in the U.S., though. That's my fault. My uh, bad. Bradley Williams, I'll give you Terry's address. So if she doesn't make it, you can come kick the crap out of him. My bad. My bad. Uh, anyway. Uh, there's lots of speculation. Obviously, the number one speculation is she's going to Innova because that's where Bradley is. Uh, well, that's where he's currently. Bradley's his contract is up. Um, I, I wouldn't put any any stock in her going to Innova, particularly just because who knows? There's a lot of things that seem logical. Yeah, that I mean, don't happen. She, she, it's just as logical. She should go to. She could go to Lat sixty four. It's just as logical. She could go to, uh, and, mm. and you know, clash a any of the well, Europe the Norwegian. Is it lift? Who, who makes the Norwegian disc? Oh, uh, not, not lift not loft loft loft. Yeah. I mean, anyway, <laughs> lots of speculation out there. Nobody knows for sure, but we do know that Terry has homework tonight. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. Ooh. Totally spaced. Yeah. Sorry. At least I reminded him. Yes. Thank you. I'm surprised she didn't remind me today. <laughs> she probably trusts you stupidly. <laughs> well, that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. Uh, it just leaves me alone to do something like that. I don't know. No. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll see. Uh, now, is it is it true? Then this falls into the speculation category. It's all speculation because, at this point. Only because isn't it true that uh, Williams' contract is up at the end of this year too? It is. Yes. Okay. So uh, clearly, like uh, you said, there 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 could be an assumption of sorts that she I, may go there, but also an assumption of sorts that they could they could both they could both go to two totally different places correct she could go to Innova and he could leave yeah and be, wouldn't that be wild because as i've 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 said my couple's theory on disc golf is don't have the same sponsor as your no. significant other it's just better you know why why not have all your bases covered and i've also said that i think Bradley Williams 
should be on the star team. And if he's not, he should find a new sponsor. Mm. That'd be- I, I, he's been with Anova forever. And he, he's got a, probably a very good relationship with them and whatnot. But Bradley, I think, is a known commodity and as a top finisher in our sport. It just sure feels like Innova should put him on that star team. And I, we've said before, I, we don't. Your feels mean nothing. My feels That's mean what nothing. Said before. But I'll reiterate, your feels mean nothing. <laughs> and I only say that because if, if, I don't know if this is the case still, but if there are stringent guidelines and rules and regulations for who's on what team, if you make an exception. I know. To put somebody on a team that, I'm, in theory, doesn't fit in there, just based on feels, as a company and as a a, a co uh, or as a teammate, you're opening up your 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 can of a can of worms. A wor- I, worms. I've, I've That's put all some, I'm saying. I know, and I've put some thought into this, and I'm thinking like I don't know the criteria that Bradley doesn't meet. Exactly. Yeah. That would not put him on the star team based on who is currently on the star team. I look at some of the players and I, and I say, Bradley is just as good or better than them. And, uh, uh, by some playing metrics, by, by playing metrics. And Yerky makes a move. Just, does Bradley move plastic? I don't think in of a star team has ever really been about, um, I, I think you can stay on the star team because you move plastic. I don't think it's necessarily ever got you on the star team. Usually, in of in traditionally, and granted, we're old. In of a star team has usually been um, what you ha- what you've done on the course, mm-hmm. usually ratings base or on the course. And I I feel like Bradley has to check almost all those boxes. I don't know what the boxes are. Gut instinct says he checks them. I hope he makes it to a star team or at least starts to look elsewhere to somebody else's top tier team. I feel like he is a top player in our sport and he deserves to be on a top team wherever that may be. So it just, I don't see Bradley leaving because I think he really likes the plastic. I think he's very comfortable um, and, and he's just in a good, He's I think he's in a really good place in life and with his, hopefully with his sponsor, but we'll see. We've got, about a month before we find out probably a lot of this stuff. It's the end of November right now, and most of these things start coming out towards the end of December. We hear them. Usually we start hearing some whisperings right, you know, a little bit before Christmas, and then they start becoming shouts after Christmas. Yeah, we. Uh, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how it unfolds. Yerky says he does not have elite or above win, right? Question mark? Wrong. Well, he, he, he has the win. It becomes the question. He he won an elite. The funny part is he won an elite event two years ago with a preserve. Correct. So in 2022. 2022. Uh, I feel like it was five. Was oh. it five or six years right after? E- either. We can we could look this up. But either way, sure. Th- th- that particular year, I, the question obviously for a lot of people is like, does that reset? Does that matter? You know what? Yeah. What have you done for me lately? You know, Based on it, like I said, but, and I'll say that I, I'm not shy of this. <laughs> Innova's star team isn't spectacular. Like, look at the players that are on there on tour. You've got Calvin, who is their top player. After that, who's finishing near the top like Bradley is? Now, now again, we're coming into the offseason. There's a good chance. What happens if Innova picks up a, a Gannon Burr or... Uh, Eagle McMahon or whomever else might be on thing. The, the, the teams will all shift in about a month. Mm-hmm. But again, as I say, Bradley is currently ranked number 26th in the United States tour rank. He was higher than that on the pro tour. So I, I'm, I'm looking at him. He's, he's got, uh, he had a, a European win this year, finished th- mm-hmm. uh, third at a European that. event. Second, again, he finished second at a major this year. I, I just fifth place at the at Jonesboro, um, second place at a silver event, the end of a Blue Ridge. I mean, he's he's had an, what I would say is maybe an up and down season, anywhere from fifteenth to thirtieth to you know second at the major. If you want to talk about what have you done for me lately, the last major of the year is a of your current sponsors a pretty darn good lately. Um, who knows? We'll find out in a month, but ultimately. Uh, again, <laughs> if I didn't know better, and I because I do know better, yeah. I'd feel like you're I'm his you're agent. His, you're his agent. I'm and not. I know you're not. I'm not Bradley's <laughs> That's the agent. Funny part, but uh, I, but I do feel like 
I can look at someone's skill level and potential and current situation and make a general gist of where that person should be, whether it's Bradley or Gannon or whomever that might be, you know, Alden Harris, uh, Eagle McMahon, pick one, you know, you, you could ask me and you'll tell me where they should be. I will tell you where I feel they should approximately be like who okay. should be on a tour team. Okay, well, I guess all we can do is wait and see. At we this will point wait and find and out and see if if somebody makes you really happy or really mad. The good thing is, <laughs> I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> I'll tell you what I think. Uh, also, in news, which unfortunately, due to some poor scheduling on my behalf, the way to go. I did not see any of last evening's. Uh, CBS Sports Network airing of the Throw Pink slash USDGC. Uh, by the way, uh, it was the 2022 preserve he won. Yeah. Um, so I did not see any of that. Uh, I'm looking for feedback. I didn't see a lot of conversation about it today, but I did not look for conversation about it today. I don't know if it was well received uh, or not. I'm assuming the editing was was solid again. Uh, there was, I think, obviously a more concerted effort to feature FPO competition, uh, where I felt like the first one was more MPO heavy. And the the one clip I saw somebody else post, did I think we again had Germ and and Earhart maybe doing a voiceover of sorts, which must be in a a a complete overhaul in terms of voiceover, just because they they weren't in the booth. No especially for that event because that was FBO, but they weren't in the booth for that and they weren't on post-production for that. So that's a, a completely new team uh, to be part of that production, uh, which I know some people had questioned uh, during the first one and then probably would question even more so during this one if you questioned it during the first one. But uh, that's who I'm going to assume is part of the team for the final event that gets showed as well. And that's another uh, week or two if i recall so all right um so if anyone has anything of any um input on that i'd love to hear more about it but hopefully it all went well i didn't see any major blow-ups i didn't see anybody absolutely losing their mind and making a complete <laughs> I, uh, uh for better or worse i didn't see anything on social media about it yeah i didn't that, that's what i'm saying i feel like it, it was relatively quiet it's cbs which is another i mean it's it's one of those channels that it's like a secondary tier sports channel. Sure. It's not your ESPN. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that you're going to get much social traction from there. It's probably a great piece. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of but like a lot of just, those other, like you said, when it's a second tier, uh, it's not necessarily included in every yeah. package. Some people need to either have a certain cable network or provider to get it or you have to pay a separate fee to have it and all those types of things so there's obviously barriers and obstacles but hopefully anyone that did see it again we can't say this enough times just like the last one i'm sure however it was edited it wasn't edited for you or for me uh, you know to try to uh yeah, it's not meant to, to uh you know satiate the appetite of diehard disc golfers it's probably a little bit more structured and geared toward um, you know, the, the people just flipping through channels, looking for something different to watch. All right. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other international news other than obviously that date changing, which you mentioned with the, um, regarding the major, which oh, by and large, I'm sure is well received over there. I'm sure I don't think there was too much. Everybody more, loved it over there. Um, to it. Uh, no, I mean again, we're, we we just had Turkey Day, so there there wasn't a lot of um, there wasn't a lot of action going on. I think everyone's just at home, kind of visiting family and doing whatever they do. All right. Oh, okay. Uh, um, I don't know if we have a lot more to discuss, unless you guys do out on the board. You can start thinking about it. But if uh, if not, uh, Johnny V here is going to start working on our. Oh, I'm giveaway. Re I'm ready, Terry. We have 134 ready? people eligible for our giveaway tonight, and you giveaway. can be eligible if you go to patreon.com slash smashbox TV for as little as a dollar a month. You can support us and be eligible for our drawing. You can also go to smashbox.tv slash weekly giveaways and enter in there by hand every week like a schlub. 
thanks to the people who are supporters. Um, we're, we're, we're working on our Patreon supporter disc. That's at the $3 and above level. We should be getting that finalized here in the next few, uh, next few weeks and get that shipped out sometime early in the 2024 uh, season. And it's thanks to all of the patrons for supporting us. It's why we can continue to do this week after week, after week, after week, after week, after week. So thank you. Thank you very much. We have 134 people tonight eligible. As I said, Terry Miller, how are we going to give, we, we already know what we're giving away. We're giving away that, that pink DD disc. Well, it might not be this pink one. Okay. Cause this I I'm think sorry. is technically, well, we probably have another one. Okay. So we're giving say, away this one's, uh, we're giving disc. away a dynamic disc slash trilogy uh, with, based uh, product, though, with the drawings by Trent artwork on it. That okay. much so we do know. Not necessarily that exact pink this one. This is a river. I think I had some rivers and diamonds left. Um, so, yeah, we'll get you something for sure. How are we going to do it is what, the question. What number should we draw, Terry? You know, Zoe's 40th. Mm. And we had four guests tonight. So I think the fourth number seems, okay. seems appropriate. That, we rarely go four. That does seem the appropriate. default is two. Our first number was 80. Our second number is 66. Our third number is 44. Uh, and then we went to 84. 84. 84 is our number. Let me not dox anybody. I started it by email address this week. 84. When you go down to 84, you get Matt Sayers. Matt Sayers, congratulations. Matt Sayers, I like it. Yeah. Ooh. Based on what I'm seeing here, his donation level and the total amount that he's given, he's a brand new person. So literally, Matt, yeah, he signed up November 14th. He's been on for two weeks and he wins. You, Matt. Matt, you're coming out way ahead. Matt played. This weekend in the cold turkey, so he already has this frisbee. <laughs> well, so I'll have to find a mold he didn't pick. He got to pick uh, okay. two out of the 12 uh. or 14 molds that I had. And uh, Matt Sayers, who also was an extra supporter at the cold turkey this weekend. Well, thank so you, Matt. Matt uh, yeah, all around uh, generous, kind. Well, thanks for supporting, superstar. Matt. Superstar. Thank you, Matt. What we a lucky it. SOB. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how are you only playing that long and then all of a sudden you're a winner? No, how come you, yeah, he's supporting a, that long. Supporting anyway. that long. We've got people who've been supporting a long time, a lot longer time than aren't winning. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Ray. I'm sorry, Tim. I guess wow. you just got to be Matt Sayers. Matt played in one PDG event this year. And it was yours? Was this weekend. Oh, mine. That's cool. Well, now he's got an ex, he's going to have an extra disc coming his way. Love it. Thank you, Matt. We appreciate it. So, yeah, that's pretty awesome. We'll have to see what disc he uh, what disc he picked. <laughs> That's pretty funny. The, maybe one of the few guys that doesn't need one of these uh, custom well, discs. But I like mean, I said, here's it, what you do: ask him, ask him if he wants another one of those discs. If he doesn't, if he would prefer a different disc, we can give that one away next week. Oh my gosh, you just to spread the love, you? Terry. But we'll we'll get back to you on that one. Yes. Either way, thank you, uh, Matt Sayers. We appreciate it. Uh, yeah, my only, one of my only remaining questions, Johnny, this one, this one could pertain to you. Ooh, uh. Do I host chaining in the new year, a flex start on new year's Eve this year, which would coincidentally be on Sunday, the 31st. I guess I could technically run it on Saturday, the 30th. Um, I always usually just pick the last weekend, um, uh, going into uh, the if, new year. But if I were you, I would do it on Saturday. I would okay. not do it on New Year's Eve if you can, just because. Even if it's a flex start, even if it's a flex start, okay. I just feel like there's probably people that are going to go out on Saturday because it's New Year's, and you're also gonna have people that are gonna go out on Sunday. That maybe Saturday might be a better. It might be more enticing to people, depending on what you are looking for. If you're looking mm. for a lot of people, I think Saturday would be the better option than Sunday because not many people are gonna be working Monday, being the first. Yeah, I think almost no one. But that's not going to stop some people from having some fun. Mm. Uh, also, speaking of fun, we're technically uh, both in Croatia and here in the U.S. Uh, Dinko is celebrating a birthday um, over there in Croatia. So happy birthday to you, Dinko. I see that's today. Oh, he happy, might be up even listening to happy it. Happy birthday. So, 
Um, yeah, okay. Well, that's that's the one of the things swirling around. Our good friend Tom McManus wants me to uh, commit to chaining in the new year a flex start somewhere. Uh, it does sound fun. I did it last year, but uh, we'll see if we're going to do it again this year. So, Beaver uh, Dam, here we come. Beaver Dam, random beaver roundup. That could be uh, that could be brought back. That was a fun tournament. That was that a great I tournament. Hosted for many years. So, I don't think I have much else. It's been a long night. We had uh, some phenomenal guests in the regular you, show. You've got a homework assignment. That. I do. I'm going to drive home and uh, pull up the requirements that uh, Luke had uh, laid out or the uh, potential things to be included. And I will write, <laughs> I will write up a uh, referral letter or referral slash recommendation letter uh, for her to potentially be uh, able to get a, f I, I believe it's a five-year sports visa, which we've heard about with mm -hmm. Thomas Gilbert and a few others yeah. throughout the years. I think that's relatively common, whether it's four or five years, doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, I know that she is applying. That's what she's hoping to apply for. And I feel, again, I feel honored and flattered she'd ask me. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank, thank goodness we had the reminder. Bradley, he lives in Pewaukee, <laughs> if anything happens. I mean, Bradley could just I'm move already to your, Norway. I'm already your agent. He could always just clearly. Yeah, so I'll give you the Terry's info. <laughs> you could dox me. I mean, he's just. Uh, it's he, he dude, it's so Norway. hard to dox you. I could literally <laughs> Google your name, yeah, and I think your address comes probably. up. All right, let's close this out. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Again, we had a great time with uh, Chandler, Raven, Zoe, and Dustin. Keep doing great work over there at Uplay. Uh, and if you want to find a way to support them, there's tons of different ways you can do that or support any nonprofit here within Disc Golf. Support everyone. Support your locals, whatever they're doing. For Johnny V, I'm the Disc Golf Guy. I'll see you guys uh, coming to you from Florida, from Gainesville this weekend. Looking forward to the action down at the show. This has been Smashbox TV's Podcast 482. We'll see you next week. You step inside the Smashbox. <laughs>